It is time, ladies and gentlemen. I am so happy to have Dave Collin back on the podcast. This is the QTR Podcast. Today is September 12th, 2020. I am the worst podcast in history, but yet also the reason you have an internet connection. Happy to be the worst and the best for everybody and nobody at all times. Look, folks, I'm just stoked to be here, all right? That's all you need to know. Today's podcast, like all of my podcasts, is brought to you by my Patreons. Patreons are people that sign up through Patreon or patrons or whatever they're called. The point is they give me money and they keep the podcast going. I want to shout out my patrons first and foremost before we get started. Then I'm going to give you the rules for the podcast today. And in about six or seven minutes, we should be ready to roll with the man himself, Dave Collum. First and foremost, I want to shout out my friends over at masterworks.io masterworks is a cool little company that i actually use myself it provides you access to the alternative art market where normally you wouldn't have access to the alternative art market because you're all broke fucks just like me masterworks lets you invest in shares of blue chip art from artists like banksy warhol uh, and other well-known names they buy art at auction they qualify the paintings with the sec And then they take the paintings public through a Reg A offering, then allowing you to invest with uh, small sums of money so you can buy shares in works of art that you normally might not have access to. It's a very cool concept. I had Scott Lynn, the CEO, on the podcast back in May of this year. Um, And you can check out masterworks.io and enter promo code QTR to skip their 15,000-person wait list. If you want to check it out, it's masterworks.io and code QTR. Uh, I use it. I have some money with them. Uh, I like the platform. Make sure you see also their uh, disclaimer at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. I want to thank those guys for reaching out and supporting this podcast specifically. This podcast is also brought to you by my exclusive gold and silver providers at JM Bullion. JM Bullion has a decade-long track record of being a wonderful gold and silver provider. They are the only place that I purchase my gold and silver. You heard that. It is the only place I go to buy my bullion. They turn around my orders quickly. They ship things on time. They always have a great inventory. They're a reputable company. They've done over $3 billion in sales over the last 10 years. And just from talking to the people there, I just like them. Uh, I like doing business with them. They are easy to speak to people. They are honest people. And I think that's all really important. When, especially when you're buying gold and silver. So QTR podcast listeners actually have their own JM Bullion sales rep. Her name is Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y, at jmbullion.com. If you want to shoot her an email, tell her you want $5 off your order and tell her you want free shipping, she will make sure that you get taken care of if you tell her QTR sent you. My dear friends over at JM Bullion, thanks so much for your continued support. Speaking of continued support, my man Pete Hedgetus over at The Trader's Path continues to support the QTR podcast. The Trader's Path is a day trading service that was started by Pete Hedgetus because he got tired of the nonsense and the bullshit of the other day trading services that you see. You know, the kind where you see the Fox advertising on YouTube, uh, the annoying guys that tell you how great they are and how much money they make. Pete did that for a while and then decided, well... I don't really want to do this anymore because I'm getting the feeling I'm being front run and I'm getting a feeling these people don't really give a shit about me. And I have to say, Pete, you probably got pretty good instincts, buddy. Aside from supporting my podcast, you may have hit that one dead on the head, my dear friend. So Pete started his own service called The Trader's Path. They do a daily watch list. They do live streams every day. They do investor education. They trade red markets. They trade green markets. It is a wonderful community to join if you're a day trader and you're looking to surround yourself with people that are like-minded and in the industry. Pete, like all of my patrons, good guy, honest guy, somebody that I would personally do business with, and I can vouch for him. If you reach out to him, he will give you whatever you want. Ask him for two months free. Ask him for 10% off. I don't know. Pete will give you something if you tell him quotes sent you. Trust me, he'll he'll let you check out the platform for free. So that's my dear friend Pete over at the Trader's Path. Similarly, my dear friend Sang Lucci over at the Wall Street Jesus and Sang Lucci Steam Room. It is the original options room that tracks unusual options flow. They started it, I think, almost a decade ago now. They were the OGs of tracking money coming into the options market to try and guess what moves will be made in the equities market. Nobody tracks options flow better than Sang Lucci and his group. I would trust them more than I would trust any other day trading service. 
specifically to track options flow, and that's what the Steam Room does. It's a beautiful piece of software that is going to show you not just unusual options activity, but where the big money is moving in the options market, which a lot of times can be very lucrative information. If you've been trading long enough, you know that. The Steam Room is a type of product that can pay for itself very quickly. Lucci also offers the 3LT playbook, his three rules that he used to make himself a seven-figure trader, and the Sang Lucci Master Course. Links to all of this shit is in my podcast description, so you can check it out if you would like. Reach out to Lucci personally. Tell him you want a free month or whatever, money off. He'll get you taken care of if you tell him, quote, sent you. He's my dear friend. We party in Las Vegas together, folks. We get down together. So Lucci will make sure that you get hooked up. Thank you so much, Lucci, and everybody else for your continued support. This podcast also brought to you by my friends at Traders for a Cause. My friend Ken R., Chris Bede, Nicholas Parks, Matthew Zimmer, Jay Mincemeyer, Russ Valenti, and Crichton Titus. I also want to shout out some of my newest patrons, and we're going to get started. Jim Fahey, thank you so much for signing up. My friend Wayne Barger, my buddy Billy B. just signed up a couple of days ago. Billy, I appreciate that. Very generous, my friend. Uh, my friend Gil Harum, thank you so much. Mac- Macro Degenerate Mitch, John Knott, Raymond Corota, my brother from a couple miles away over in Bluebell. David Matson, Patrick King, Avery Taylor, Brian Kilgannon, thank you guys so much. And some patrons that have been with me for a while that I want to make sure they know I'm not forgetting them like Kip. And uh, John Longo, but you don't see the rest of your name, but whatever. Thank you, whoever you are. Um, hopefully you know who I'm talking about. Crichton Titus and uh, Ginger Soros, thank you so much. CSL, I appreciate you guys. Finally, my friend Jonas Gise, uh, my buddy Bryce Kiefer, Flo Algo, Pivotal Capital, and Scott Beck, thank you so much. This podcast has a three-drink minimum. Used to be a two-drink minimum, but we've adjusted for inflation. It's Saturday. I imagine most of you guys have the three-drink minimum already. Signed, sealed, delivered, covered, and taken care of. That's why I like you guys. Your attention to detail. <laughs> and then finally, nothing on this podcast is investment advice, life advice, any kind of advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I hold no licenses, no registrations, and generally, I'm in a haze. I don't really have much of an idea as to what I'm talking about when it comes to anything. Bearing all those things in mind, why don't we get on with the damn show? All right. Very happy to have back with me on the podcast. Long overdue. My dear friend, Dave Collum. He is the Betty R. Miller Professor of Organic Chemistry at Cornell. Man, I got that shit memorized. I didn't even have to read that from anywhere. And uh, outspoken economic... I don't have a fucking bottle opener. Hold on. All right. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Dave Collum's on the podcast today. <laughs> my favorite from Cornell. How the hell are you, Dave Collum? Now my beer is open. We can get started. I'm good. I'm drinking coffee, by the way, not not beer, but that's okay. Well, I had my coffee this morning, and I went and worked out already today, so I'm I'm on beer o'clock. You don't mind, do you? No, no, no. My my uh, moral standards are pretty low. So. <laughs> if you don't know who Dave Collum is, you may recognize him from the Cornell Daily Sun, who published a editorial on June seventh, entitled entitled <laughs> entitled "Fire Professor Dave Collum." <laughs> <laughs> Catchy. I I, th- I kind of thought that was a nice touch. Yeah, that was good. Oh, Dave. So what the hell happened? The story for those of you that don't know was Dave was supposed to come on the podcast like two or three months ago. And it was about the time that the image of that old man in Buffalo uh, approached the police officers that were trying to clear out, I guess, Town Square in Buffalo. And he was waving his phone or something next to the police officer's belt. But I- incidentally, the police officer shoved the guy and the uh, the elderly man fell backward and cracked his head open and started bleeding profusely all over the sidewalk. It was... Uh, not a good scene, no matter what you, uh, no matter what your opinion is on it. But uh, ultimately, from there, Dave Collin made some comments about that on Twitter, and then roughly two hours later, <laughs> you were trending on Twitter, and everybody was calling for your job. Some actor who I've never heard of, Dave, with like a million followers, retweeted you with the, you know, hey, this guy's a Cornell professor, and lo and behold, here's the June seventh editorial from the Cornell Daily Sun entitled Fire Professor Dave Collum. So, uh, 
What's going on, Dave? What the hell happened? Well, so let's talk about that story. Um, you're underplaying your role. We were chatting when I when I put in that. So my that tweet, the the, the, the tweet. Uh, was to you okay and and what had happened is you had said something like that's uh that's appalling what the cops did yeah you, you were just aghast at it and i said in a, a very sort of measured way something to the effect well i'm gonna have to take the other side and i think I, the next line was something like we can talk about it more on saturday which is when we're scheduled to have our podcast and then i said but uh but but that guy had to give the cops more space and and I might have said something like, what's he doing poking at him? But then I said, you know, that that was self. I said, I said, um, I said that he probably did crack his skull, but it was a self-inflicted wound. And so uh, I had not seen that video until right then. So it's not something I'd been thinking hard about. And uh, and and uh, and you clearly did not agree. And uh, uh, we can talk about uh, why you're you're full of shit um, in a minute. Um, and uh, and then what happened is all of a sudden my Twitter feed turned into a bit of a storm. And so at first I was getting comments and I responded. And so one of them was I said, you know, how fried those cops are um, they're on 12 hour shifts. You know, this 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 is this is what happens. And and uh, and then all of a sudden I realized something was really wrong, and I, I couldn't quite figure out what I was witnessing. Then you sent me a direct message that said, you know, that guy who doxed you just deleted his tweet, and I had no idea what you were talking about. Yeah. And I should have clarified. And you sent me, I think, a screen grab. <clears throat> yeah of the guy pointing me out as being supportive of the police. And he's got like 3 million followers. He's, he's, he's some comedian or something on some show. I don't know what, but he posted it. And then about 30 minutes later, he had unposted it. But, but I knew something very wrong had happened because within about 30 minutes, I started getting email. I got an email from one of my colleagues saying my email box is filling up. And, and then, uh, so, so I realized that, that whether I understood it or not, I had to get control, which I was unable to. But I, I uh, the first thing I had to do was uh, lock down my Twitter account. I had to Google it. I couldn't remember how to lock it down. And then I took a quick peek and noticed that I had I'd amassed about 200 new followers. And I basically, with no care whatsoever, I, I went and uh, – I went and knocked them all out. So I knocked out all the followers who had followed me since the tweet. And then I, I went and uh, I went and looked at some of the things I'd typed. And I, it was the big mistake was everything I typed was legit. Uh, a couple of them had f bombs in them, and I just said I'm going to knock them out. I wish I had not because, but it, because it included rational thinking, even though I was a little amped up. Um, and and so then next thing within oh God, I don't know, 45 minutes or something. I get an email from uh, a group called FIRE, F-I-R-E, which is an acronym, um, that supports faculty who are under pressure on campuses uh, uh, to, 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 to promote free speech. And I've dealt with FIRE before because I had a problem with the student union organizers on campus about three years ago. And, and, and I, was, I was connected with FIRE. But they reached out to me, and I'm going, holy crap, how do they know? What, what is going on here? So, so was, I, I, knew, I knew there was something wrong here. And, and I stand by the tweet. I mean, I think the tweet was totally innocuous. I've had, I've had people say, why would you ever say it's self-inflicted? And I'm going, you go poke at a riot police and then you find yourself on your ass. Why is that not self-inflicted? Um, and I stand by that. And uh, so then the next morning I get up and I'm, I'm kind of marginally rested at this point because I had a lot of work to do that evening before. And uh, I walk past the TV and there's my wife watching the news and there's a guy getting knocked on his ass. I go, oh my God, I commented on the, the tweet of the week, uh, of the film of the week, right? So, uh, so to make a very long story short, it turned into a Fire Dave campaign, um, the Daily Sun, which is <laughs> again, a, which is which is a rag of a higher order, was was basically writing articles about me daily, and I used to call it, I started calling it the Daily Column, and uh, and which had a great double entendre, and I actually would post them on Twitter, um, but then Cornell had to go in sort of emergency mode 
because they were just inundated. So the president, so, so they got something like 2000 emails. Now that seems like a lot. Um, part of the problem was someone set up an automated mechanism to go to a website and send a nasty email to the president. And all you had to do was put in your favorite pejorative term. It's like a Mad Libs or something. And so one doesn't even know how many came from Cornell and how many came from all over the world, right? And so the 2000 doesn't mean that, uh, that you know, 20% of our undergrads got mad at me. It could, could be anything. Um, but it was stunning. I mean, it re really was stunning. And, uh, and then it became clear that the, there were dirty little grubby fingerprints of the union organizers on this thing from three years back. And I realized that I don't know what role they played, but they certainly were in there somehow. Uh, one of the other things that got real weird is I noticed, you know, when I was, I, after I locked down the account, I, I, I started just looking at who was trying to follow me after a quest to follow at that point when you lock down. And, and you can't see the, you can't see my tweets unless, unless if you haven't been, if, if you're not already following me at that point. And uh, and so people wanted to see the tweets and they couldn't. But but I I, had, I don't know probably at the time forty five thousand followers. So it's not like they were all friends of mine. So so uh, it's not like I was locking down uh, all enemies or anything like that. Um, so I started looking at who was trying to follow me, and then some one of the famous actors from the West Wing followed me, and I'm going, holy crap, what's that about? And, uh, and, uh, and so I went to his Twitter feed and this became a routine when I saw someone follow me that I thought I might be intrigued by, I would check out their Twitter feed and find out, are they left or right? That sort of thing. And I thought this guy might be, you know, the second coming of James Woods or, you know, a pinko commie douchebag. And so it turned out they were a pinko commie douchebag. So I denied their, their follow, but they had like 5 million followers. But the question is why, right? That's kind of an interesting question. Why would a, a famous person follow me? Why, why does he care? And uh, from what I saw and from what you saw, it, was, it seemed pretty clear to me that it was an exceedingly organized attack. And I, I don't know what the dog whistle was. I don't know how it was triggered, but it was so fast and so furious and so large that somehow there was, there was some sort of release the hounds instant. And, uh, and by morning it was a mess, right? By morning it was a total mess. So, uh, so that, that dragged on for a couple months. Um, and Cornell had like a war room going. Now they're trying to deal with COVID. There's all sorts of problems they're trying to deal with. But meanwhile, the university is trying to deal with this. So uh, here's what I can tell you. Here's, here's what I know. There's, there's several angles you can go at this from. One is um, my interactions with Cornell were minimal. I was talking to my department chair who used to be my associate chair when I was chair. And, uh, and he was giving me information he could. And he, he was really uncomfortable by it. He, he was, he was get, just getting earfuls. And, uh, and then, um, and I was getting, you know, I, you know, we we're all sheltered. And so there was no direct interaction. I was pretty much at home sitting on my deck. Um, but, uh, it was clear. And I sort of, um, I, I reached out to the Dean who is a serious free speech guy. And he doesn't answer his own emails unless he wants to, but, but I, I talked to his, his assistant, a high level administrator herself, but, uh, and she was really helpful. And, uh, and it was clear Cornell was trying to figure out how to resolve this. Now, um, I spent some time pondering what my risk was. And there was, a, there was a period there where I thought my risk was serious. And I started pondering the question, hypothetically, Cornell fires me, right? Which, which you, you can do to a tenured professor. It, it kind of, usually it requires having sex with the president's daughter or something like that, but, um, but it, it can be done. <laughs> and, and if you look across the country, tenured professors have been fired and, and this year because of this, this, this so-called cancellation, this cancellation cult and um, culture. And uh, so I sort of started going through, if I were sort of in court, which I would certainly have been if, if they had tried to fire me. And I thought of all the ways that I would battle Cornell. And, uh, and my, my record is really pretty unblemished. So I have 40 years of funding. I'm the only guy in the department who was director undergraduate studies, director of graduate studies, associate chair and chair. Um, I've coached two sports on campus, believe it or not. 
um, and uh, and I've I've advised many clubs and uh, and so I and 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 then to go back to the union story, um, I'm going to throw Cornell under the bus a little bit here. I never have, but this time I'm going to because uh, so Cornell eventually put out a, a, a denunciation of my comment without actually saying what it was. Yeah, I saw that. And it was signed by five high-ranking administrators. Interestingly, not my dean. I think he said, fuck you, I'm not signing it. That's what I think he did. Um, it was signed by the chief of police. I'm going, that's ironic, right? I'm defending police here. And, and, uh, <laughs> and the chief of police at Cornell signs a letter denouncing me. But they said what I said was deeply disturbing, but they didn't say what it was. And I think it was their way of giving a win to the social justice crazies and trying to get by. And it, it, it reasonably worked. Um, well, they weren't. The deep, other thing they is, weren't deeply disturbed by your comment. They were deeply disturbed by all the people fucking annoying them about it. Well, yeah, and uh, I, you know, and there were people who said, you know, why would you say it was self-inflicted? I go because it was. I, I what, what else would I say, right? How else would you state that? Some guy goes, add a bunch of rye please get shoved and falls on his ass, and cracks his skull. What what is that if it's not self inflicted, right? That's like if there's a pit bull and I start going and you know sort of jabbing it, right? At some point you're going to get bit. And that's self inflicted. <laughs> um, it turns out self inflicted turns out to be more profound than anyone realizes. We'll talk about that in a minute, maybe. But um, so in any case, I went through the went through what I would do as a as a, an attorney defending why Cornell should should not be able to fire me. And I was pretty convinced that there was a good case. And in fact, that my, my funding record was so good that, that, that my previous dean had presented my funding record. I had 20 straight federal grants without a rejection. And given 20% probability of funding, it's about one in 10 to the 13th probability of doing that, right? So she actually presented to the trustees at a trustee meeting saying, isn't this amazing? Right. So there's just there's just, just so many things. I was a Cornell undergrad. My uh, my brother-in-law is a trustee. Right. This is this is a complicated story for Cornell. Now, what makes it really complicated is that the you that, that this uh, the, this cancellation thing that they did. They dug back into um, three years ago where where so so they tried to unionize. They tried to unionize at Cornell about uh, about. 12 years ago, UAW, uh, they lost based on the fact that a unionization effort on a campus is a bad idea. It's just not a good idea. It was publicly debated. They lost two to one. No chance. The UAW tried to, tried to unionize yeah, the, yeah. You can, the you staff? Can, I can, yeah. The United just, Auto just, Workers? Yeah. Well, what you are know, you guys it, doing? Are you building fucking General Motors trucks no, on campus? No, what we'd be doing is paying them a <laughs> million dollars a year of an annuity in perpetuity for unionizing us. So it was, it's, it's 200 300, 500 campuses, you unionize them. It's a huge amount of money for the UAW. So, oh so Cornell is an you ILR free, uh, school. You get a free oil change with that? Yeah, well, Cornell's Industrial and Labor Relations School is basically a union stronghold. So they have a standing army. So they went for Cornell in, in uh, around 06. And and I didn't play a, 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 an official role in that. But, but at one point, for example, I was outspoken, right? Um, I believe I, I that. Sort of, I helped him round up one of the five grad students who who fought the union. It was a group called At What Cost, and they did the open debates and stuff like that. It was one of my grad students, one of them. And I was outspoken. At one point, they had this big, huge auditorium full of grad students. They had this panel discussion. The night before, they said, uh, they said uh, this thing's lopsided. And everyone realized it was just totally lopsided. So it just wouldn't look good. And they said, we got to get an anti-union guy here. And so that night I got a call from the dean of faculty saying, Dave, I need you to talk. He says, I need you to give a five-minute talk. I said, I don't want to do it. And he says, you have to do it. So the next day, without warning, I gave a five-minute talk, fire and brimstone about why unionization was a bad idea. They call me the guy. The guy who thinks he's a game show host is what the union organizers call me. And um, so in any event, we won big time, big time. And uh, – and then about, uh, about 2015, they showed up on campus, this time with the American Federation of Teachers, 
Now, this is a logical looking effort, right? And I realized that, that the sentiment on campus has changed and that people were kind of angry, right? This is post 09 crisis. People were kind of feeling kind of grumpy. Students were getting more progressive. And I'm going, this is a problem. So, so the union comes in and it, these are multi-million dollar efforts to, to unionize a campus because if you're gonna get a million a year, you spend a lot to unionize. So I, I was hearing all this union activity and hearing nothing from Cornell. So I sent an email off to the dean and the provost and said, I, 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 the union's alive and well on this campus again, and I'm not hearing boo out of Cornell. We have got to do something. And uh, I got an email back that said, yeah, no, we're in negotiations with them. We're not ignoring this. And, the, and then so here's throwing Cornell under the bus. That night, the provost called me, and he said, you need to – you need to help us mount a counterattack. Now, everything was done by phone call, no emails. And the provost I've known since the day he got here, and, and, and I like the guy a lot. I think he's fantastic, so I feel bad throwing him under this bus. But so he, basically, I set up the, the, the Atwood Cost anti union team completely this time. Put it this way the two seminal members were from me, and then they rounded up three more. But the union played it brilliantly, and, and they would not openly debate the anti-union guys. And we were about to get our we were about to get our asses kicked. And so, so first I so so before I got started though, I, I had a conference call with Cornell Legal, and again throwing people under the bus here. Um, it was a conference call. I, I couldn't tell how many were on the other end, but there was more than one. And I said, here's the deal. I'll 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 fight them. But if I don't get um, if I don't get multiple sanctions by the National Labor Relations Board, um, I'm going to be disappointed. And they <laughs> said we're we're okay with that. And so I said okay, I'll do it. So I was on speed dial with Cornell Counsel. I was getting help from uh, uh, this one dean in particular, Cornell, who was point person for the university too. And so if I called Cornell Counsel, they'd leave a meeting to pick up the phone to find out what I was calling about. And so, so I was like the enforcer on a hockey team in some sense. So I sent an email. I got a, an email mailing list from the university. Um, that's not public knowledge until now. And I, uh, and I emailed about 350 prominent faculty, their department heads and stuff like that, and uh, said, we got to get going. We got to get the, we got to, we got to oppose this thing. And I got nothing. I mean, I got nothing. I got crickets. I got one person interested in talking to me, and they, she wasn't sure she wanted to admit that she was anti-union. That's how bad it was. So the Atwood Cost guys are trying to debate. The union won't even take them out in public. They'd say stuff like, uh, well, you just tell us what you want to tell them, and we'll tell them. Right? I'm going, oh, yeah, that's a good plan. Um, so in any event, I, I, in desperation, I throw out another email right before the vote. And I said, you got to get your students out voting. The more, the higher the percentage of the vote, the, the lower the probability of the union. That's well known because the apathetic anti-union guys don't vote. And so, uh, so I sent out this email and if, if the union organizers had just shut up, they would have destroyed us in the vote. But one of the idiots <laughs> posted my email on social media. And then all of a sudden I'm getting calls from the Daily Sun. Now, I don't do interviews verbally if I can help it because I'm happy to do a podcast with you because you're not editing it. You're not clipping out parts. You're not taking stuff out of context, right? So someone can listen to this podcast and go, I got the picture, right? I got the picture according to Dave. That's the point. But, but a, a verbal interview is dangerous. So I've done – I'll do email interviews, but they called me, and I had done an interview with them. They didn't publish it. I said, I've already done an interview. And they said, we were writing an article about you tomorrow. <laughs> and they said, we well, want some comments. I had to do a quick audible. And I said, okay. So I talked to them. And I knew it was going to be a hammer job. I mean, no question it's going to be a hammer job. And so, um, and so I talked to them. And I got to the end. And it was really funny. I said, I'm not done yet. And she says, oh, what else would you like to say? And I said, no, that's quotable. I'm not done yet. And she goes, I heard her go, oh. And uh and that was the final line of the article. So I was just basically saying, fuck you, I'm not done. And, uh, and um, so then what happened there, that, that obviously generated a lot of activity. And then the Cornell Review, which is a conservative newspaper, we did an email interview that took about six hours. And we did, I was able to lay out the case against the union. And, uh, and, uh, and the vote came and there's a good turnout. And we, 
beat them out of 2,000 grad students, we beat them by 60 votes. Wow. Right. So they were so unhappy. This is multi-millionaire. The head of the American Federation of Teachers, ex-Cornell Industrial Labor Relations graduate, shows up at campus the day before the vote to rally the troops. And Chuck Schumer, I'm told, shows up. And she gives a speech and she says, she gives this rally, you know, go vote speech. And at the very end, she says, I don't want to get political. But then she starts hammering me for invading the process. And I'm going, I hurt you. I hurt you, didn't I? They lost the vote. So I think their mistake, that fateful moment, that dummy put it on social media, they lost the vote on that moment. So now what happens? I'm a civilian again, right? I'm done. But three, <laughs> but three weeks later, an article in the Daily Sun appears. They had gone through my entire Twitter feed, and you can imagine how grisly this could get. And they took a whole bunch of crap out of context, and they attacked me with everything they had. Now, I then I couldn't even read the article. I got partway through it. I said, "Shit!" I asked my students to read it and say, "Tell me, tell me what's in there." I can't read it. And uh, they came back and they said, you know, I don't think they got you, but it's, it's kind of gruesome, but I don't think they got you. Um, so then I got a call from a guy named Bill Jacobson, who on Twitter's legal insurrection and college insurrection, and, and very, he's a real feisty guy. He's in the law school. He says, you've seen the article? I go, yeah. And, and then that's sad. That was a Friday. Saturday, he calls me and says, uh, this is, again, 2017, I think, um, I'm going to write a counterattack. If you don't mind, I said, have a ball. So he went at him and he reamed him. He, he bent them over and was making them squeal like pigs. And I think by the end, they were, they were uh, lawyering up. And so, uh, so Kyle came and said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm happy as hell now. Yeah, I read and, his, uh, I read his response. So, so, it was really So good. that was that. So I'm Google toxic now at this point, but, but I don't <laughs> care. I, I don't care. So as the world according to me, so dial forward three years. And then right. there's this tweet, and then all of a sudden, uh, and I think somehow, and I don't know how they did it, I haven't been able to figure out the mechanism, somehow these uh, union douchebags um, um, somehow were waiting, and they chose that moment. I don't know why, because it seemed like an innocuous tweet. Well, But well, my Twitter feed filled up with people saying, we're going to get you, and we're going to cancel you. and we're gonna... There's a thing called race showing, which I presume means they have a large number, and I'm the denominator of one. Okay, so I think that's race showing. I'm not quite sure. And so, uh, so, so I was getting the crap pounded out of me, and, and I'm having conversations with prominent guys who are really helpful. I, I did get some email support. I, I, I had... I probably spent five hours on the phone with Einhorn, who's always been very supportive, and he's a trustee and 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 a big free speech guy. And and the guy who really helped me though was my brother-in-law, who hadn't didn't even know about it. And then I'm sitting on the porch when and he walks over and he smiles at me, and I got I go, oh, you read about it, didn't you? And he goes, yeah. And then he basically said, uh, you know, you got you got to fight these guys. And, and he said, if not you, then who? And so that kind of that kind of you know threw a bucket of cold water. I, mean, I was going to write an apology to my department. Why? Saying, Sorry to bring this. Well, because I brought a lot of shit on their heads. Right. Right. So, I was, but then I, I, the message I'm going to say to any reader who hears, any listener who hears this, is don't apologize to anyone. That, right. That, the, 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 they will not say, "Oh, okay, all's forgiven." It will not do right. anything. Never apologize to those crazies. So he woke me and he said, if, and he said who's going to protect the next guy and the next guy and the next guy? No, you have to fight this. And that was really helpful. So, um, but, but it was tough because my wife was still saying, you know, why would you put it was self-inflicted? I said, because it was, for fuck's sake, it was self-inflicted, right? So it eventually seems to have died down. The Daily Sun went at me probably eight times. And they would just be writing an article about some sporting event and go, oh, by the way, Dave's a douchebag, right? I, they would find ways <laughs> to put it in almost any article. And, uh, and so then it seems to kind of calm down. Um, and uh, and so, so here's the question, what's behind the tweet? And I'm not going to let you off the hook on this one. So what's going on? What happened with that guy in Buffalo? And I'm writing about this one. The, the guy in Buffalo is a scam artist, complete, unambiguous scam artist. The guy who fell back and bonked his head. 
That whole story is a ruse. That whole story is wrong. You thought it was right. I thought it was wrong. You're full of shit. I'm correct. And here's the story. All right. The guy is a professional activist, right? And you go, okay, so what? The guy, he's been painted as a Christian god fearing whatever. You go to his goddamn Twitter feed and his Facebook page. It has stuff like, fuck the police. And I've screen grabbed a bunch. So there's all these little pieces that fit together. And at some of them, you go, okay, that's a little weird. And others, you go, oh, that's seriously weird. So what happens is the first thing that I, that I pick up on is that he goes down and blood comes squirting out of his ears. Now, I talked to a number of MDs and I did a lot of Googling. And, and when you get a major brain injury, you can get blood out of your ear. But it's when the pressure builds. The blood does not squirt out of your ear. You don't hit the ground and, and get a, a geyser coming out of your ear, which is exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. It squirted out of his ear. And, and to explain that, it's real weird. And there are people showing close-ups of his mask and saying, you see that thing right there? That's a tube. So they think he put a tube in his ear. I'm going to give some probabilities here. So, so all these little pieces of information, that one I, I put down the list, although I can't explain squirting blood. But, but just now you're just going to have to sort of archive these in your heads as you're listening. Okay, so that's the first thing I saw. Now, a guy goes down and smashes his head on the pavement. You tell me, right? This is a Joe Rogan thing, right? It's not the punch. It's the goddamn head hitting the pavement. Where are his feet at this point? Describe if you did a chalk outline, where are his feet? They're splayed out, right? He's out cold. They're splayed. He's limp as a noodle. The photos of him, his legs are crossed like he's sleeping. And you go, that's kind of odd. And social media, so, some, some distant characters. This was not chatted a lot. By the way, Zero Hedge eventually kind of wrote about this, so they kind of got it put it together too. So his legs are crossed. I'm going, yeah, lay on the ground on a hard pavement and cross your legs. Tell me that's a stable position for a guy who's out cold. The answer is it's not. Okay, so interesting tidbit number two. So he's got evil shit on his Facebook page and in his Twitter feed. Um, meanwhile, while all this is playing out, so he goes to the hospital, all this crap, his Twitter feed is getting cleaned up by the day, right? Someone is mowing through his Twitter feed and cleaning it up, and someone's mowing through his Facebook account and cleaning up to make him look like a saint. While he's supposedly in the ICU. Now, so then what happens is you go, uh, you go, well, what else is odd about the story? Well, what happens is the thing that was the, 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 the smoking gun was a video of him before the event. Okay, so, so then let me give you something less dicey. The mayor of Buffalo said that he had been a pest all week long. Right, I saw and that. And so the cops were really frustrated with him all week long. And so the push was a frustrated cop. And by the way, anyone who calls that push brutality is full of shit. That push was not brutality. If he cracked his skull, that's a brutal outcome. But the push was not brutality. Right. He didn't do a body slam. He didn't crack him over the skull with a baton. He pushed him out of the way. And that, therefore, is not brutality. Now, the media ran with this and ran with it and ran with it. And they took out the audio and they cut the video short. If you get a full video and you get a full audio, you, the guy goes down. You can see one cop start to try to help the guy. Now, so, now, so some people, for example, people, friends of mine, looked at the phone and said he took a dive. I can't see it. It doesn't look like he took a dive. I could believe he, he started to think he's taking a dive and then lost it, but it looked to me like he just stumbled backwards. But some people think he took a dive. So... So, so a cop starts to help him, and you can hear the other cops say, stay in formation, we've got a medic coming. And if you follow the video, a few seconds later where the media cut it off, you follow it for about three more seconds, a medic shows up. So the cops were not irresponsible either. And that's the part that enraged people so much, and therefore when I defended the cops, enraged them so much. 
the cops knew a medic was there. They had him coming, and the, the guy who went out and then was pulled off because they're in formation because they're dealing with riot-like stuff, and that's a military-like operation. So the medic shows up about three seconds after the media cuts it off. The full video started showing up too late, by the way. Damage had already been done. But the cops did nothing wrong. You could say that, you know, maybe they shouldn't have pushed them. But yeah, these guys are fried. One of my tweets says these guys are fried. And they are fried. And you're on some 12-hour shift and some old man's poking at you. And, I, and in my tweet, I said, why is he poking at him? Yeah, he was doing something weird. He had something in his hand. And yeah, we'll, we'll I'll talk, tell you we'll, what we'll, he we'll, had. We'll, we'll talk about the rest of this in, in, in a couple of minutes because I, I obviously have a lot more I want to say. But – I did notice he was standing next to the cop. He had walked up to him and he had something in his hand and he was waving it like around the cop's belt and around. Well, like... you saw the slow-mo, right? Uh, yeah, but I don't remember it off the top of my head, but I remember well, that's noticing how you it saw that. And thinking... So what I saw, what I saw in the fast thing, it looked to me like he was poking at him with his phone, like kind of like he might poke your finger at the guy or something. So I know why is he poking at the cop? And then when you slow down the, the, the video, it is unambiguous. He is scanning him like it's a metal detector. He's got something. Yeah, that that's what like it looked phone. like. That's exactly what it it's looked like. Called, it's called skimming. You can get an app for your phone. You can also get a special device that looks like a phone. And you skim and you scan a person's, like someone can walk up behind you with a skimmer and they can get all the information off your phone without ever touching you. It's called skimming. People actually um, figure out where a master bedroom in a house is, will assume that you put your phone on the nightstand, and they will raise up on a pole, a skimmer, scan your phone, and get all the shit off your phone from outside the house in the middle of the night. They say, do not store your phone on the outer wall of your house is the advice. So it's called skimming. It has got to be illegal. The well, guy, of course when you slow illegal. the video down. If that's what was he, happening, of course it's illegal. Now, there's no you. You go to the slow mo, you will not have a doubt. He was scanning. He was he was swiping back and forth across the cop's belt. Yeah, but we don't know definitively what yes, the purpose I do. of that. Well, you can t yeah, you, okay. You don't, you, don't have, you, you don't have definitive proof that that's what he was doing, but he was definitely. No, no, no. I only have a 98 percent bet that I'd clean your ass in Vegas every time. <laughs> but he was definitely waving. It looked like you said, like a metal detector. Like you go to a sporting event and you wave the handheld right. one in front of the exactly. guys. Exactly. Put you your know? hands up and they scan you with the wand. That's what he was that's doing. That's kind of what it looked like. By yeah. the way. The Economist, The Economist, the magazine, said he was skimming. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's so in any event, so then he falls, his legs are crossed, blood squirting out of his head in the weirdest possible way. Then what I run across is a video. This is the smoking gun. The video is before the event. And the guy is standing there, and it's him, and he's got a and, – and you said – I remember at one point you said he was trying to return a cop's riot helmet to him or something That's like that. That's what it that looked like. Yeah, he had the cop's helmet. Yeah, that was helmet. his own helmet. That was his own helmet. So in this video of the guy standing there talking, there's an argument. You can see the old man, and I'm checking out his clothes. Say, yeah, same shirt, same pants, same cut, same hair, same everything, yeah. because at this point I'm checking everything. And he had the helmet, right? And he had the helmet under his arm, and he yeah. was standing. By the way, you remember how feeble he looked? Yeah. Well, the guy was standing there like a guy who didn't look that feeble. There, the way he held himself, this is not an old man saying, oh, could someone give me a chair? This, is, this hurts to stand. No. He, looked, he was ready to do battle. He had his helmet under his arm. And there's a big argument going on. And the guy filming it walks up, and he's, you can hear people saying shit. And, and at one point, you can hear this woman say, why would you do that to lose their pensions? Right. And, and, and he walks up this young black guy, and, the, and he says, what's going on here? The guy with the phone camera. And the black guy says, he says, this guy thinks, this, this white dude thinks this is fun. He says, I don't see anything fun about this. This is yeah. serious shit. He says, I, I don't video. see a barbecue. I don't see a barbecue. I don't see a grill here. This is not fun. And then they chat some more, and then the black guy says, this white dude wants to go get punched in the face by the cops. So it was a setup. It was a setup. He wanted the conflict. So then more shit shows up. That, that was, I give it 100% credibility. That video, I scrutinized that thing. That thing was absolutely legit video. And so you could see his motivation right there. 
So then what happens, I can run into other photos. There's a, I noticed there's a photo of him. First of all, I noticed that, that um, there's a photo of him sitting up on the ground. And that's everywhere. That's public knowledge. And you look at the back of it, he doesn't have much hair, right? Not a scuff, not a scrape, no gash, right? You split your skull open. Not even a road rash on the back of his head. And he's sitting up. Now, someone tell me, and I've asked many medics this, you show up on the scene, and you've got a guy with a major skull injury. You brace his neck, don't you? And they go, absolutely. You would brace his neck first because you don't know what else is damaged up there. And he was sitting up. You would not sit the guy up. Period. Period. Now, how do I know this? My wife has had the, we've had to call the, the ambulance probably 12 times to come to my house. She has all sorts of health problems, none of which were me throwing her down the stairs, anything like that. They're all real health problems. I know how they work. I know how they work. And so, so none of this is making sense. And then the last thing is there's a picture of him on a gurney behind the ambulance. And it's propped up at about a 45 degree angle. And he's talking on his cell phone. Now I checked to see which ear. <laughs> it was the other ear, which would have been priceless if it was the ear with the blood squirting out. He was talking on his cell phone and then some medic, which I'm gonna still check, I'm gonna confirm this, some medic said, look in that ambulance, there's nothing in the ambulance. That is an unstocked ambulance. So then you start reading about the guy and you go, oh my God, he's in the ICU, he's in intensive care, he's, he can't walk, he's this. And then you go, well, something bad happened. So I start fishing around HIPAA laws and I finally run into a guy on Twitter who just finished writing up a full document for his hospital on HIPAA. And HIPAA laws say docs can't say shit about your condition, right? That protects patients' privacy. And I said, can they tell someone that you're in the hospital? And he said, sure, but a patient can also sign an agreement that says, do not even divulge that I'm here. And the HIPAA laws say you have to honor that. Right. So you don't know if he's even in a hospital. And then you read every article about that goddamn guy's skull getting crushed. And every one of them is he's in this bad shape according to his lawyers. And this is happening according to his lawyers. And this is happening according to his lawyers. Every single statement about his health is according to his lawyer. Now he's recuperating in an undisclosed location for his privacy. None of this can be confirmed because no one can get off, can be told whether the guy's in the hospital or not. All right. So let's talk about what common ground we have when it comes right. to the video and we'll start there number one because i i also just replayed it for myself here uh right in front of me while you were commenting because i wanted to re-familiarize myself with it something i should have done before the podcast but you know wow. i don't do any work so the first thing that we can definitely agree on is he was holding a device and he poked it at one officer and then he poked it at the other one. So if you look at the video very closely, he's waving a device over the officer's belt and over another officer's belt. That's number one. Number two, the thing that I agree with you with is, you know, hey, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, right? You're out in the middle of town square in Buffalo. There's probably... Four dozen officers here who obviously their role for that day was to clear out the town square, restore law and order, etc. You know, there was all kinds of property damage and all kinds of mayhem in Buffalo prior to this. Um, and instead of just moving out of the way and doing something else, he decided to approach these officers who were walking, who were walking toward him, I guess, trying to clear the area. Um, and so he was, in fact, uh, pushed out of the way and then he falls over onto the ground um and i see actually now too in the video where he fell and his legs are crossed while he's laying on the ground so i can see that and i can confirm uh what you were saying there uh the thing that got me about the video uh was that when he fell to the ground he uh there's a couple of officers that you can see they kind of stop momentarily for half a second and they look at him and it's clear he's 
you know, I don't know if I buy into the theory that he's got a tube of blood coming out of his ear. But... Yeah, I, that that one's just the weirdest of them all. Yeah. That's the one that I have least confidence in. Yeah, Although I can't I, explain I don't have, the blood. I don't have a lot of confidence in it either. I'm sure but there's you, a medical Can you explain reason. the blood, though? Well, no, but I'm, not, yeah, but I'm not a physician. I mean, you well, know, but so I you, talked to the guys physicians fucking and they say, said, listen, no. Colin, when you're 75 fucking years old, if somebody looks at you the wrong way, you start bleeding or you bruise. So I guess so. But that came out in a gush. All right. Well, putting that aside, the, the, the beef that I had and the reason I pointed it out was because, I, you know, with the George Floyd incident, and we could talk about that in a second. One of the big deals about that incident was that people stood idly by after he had gone unconscious and the guy stayed on his neck for, you know, seven, eight, nine minutes after that. And so that was a big point of contention. Um, and in this instance, what happened was he fell over, whatever. He cracked his head. He was obviously not doing well. He was obviously elderly. And there were a moment where the cops kind of looked at him for a split second and then they just kept walking. And you can talk about you know what they were what they were under orders to do and whether or not a medic was coming or anything like that um but for me it was just more of like on a humanitarian level even if the guy was trying to create trouble even if he shouldn't have been there even if you know look you're 75 years old yeah you're but out you're watching a Ryan video Bruce. you're not you're not listening to the audio i don't need to listen to the audio yes I've, you do I've though watched... you do no, no, no. That's bullshit. You need the audio because the commands tell the story. But I, the guy who's I, in charge says, "Stay in formation. A medic is coming." I and four I seconds that. later, I a medic that. shows up. I concede that to you. I, I'm not arguing with well, you. So there's with nothing you wrong. There's nothing wrong. There's an optics problem. Yeah, I just don't know. I just tell me what's wrong. Tell me what's wrong. I just get the impression from watching a couple of these officers that they they are unsure whether or not to care for this guy who has exactly. who has fallen over. And to exactly. me to me just on a on a baseline humanitarian response level, my instinct would be to go over and try to care for this person regardless of whether I agree with them or not or whether they had just assaulted me or didn't no, assault me. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when your commander says stay in formation, a medic's coming, you stay in formation because a medic's coming. Right. Well, hey, I was never... You don't get, you don't get to make that call. I, I, you I, don't. As an officer, you don't get to make that call. If the guy in charge says stay in formation, you stay in formation. Right. I understand that. And I never served so in the military. And I was never a police officer. Right, but it's a military-like concept. Yeah. And if your commanding officer says stay in formation, you say, fuck you, I'm going to go help the guy, you're in trouble. Correct, correct. And therefore, when he says a medic's coming, and a medic did show up on the same video. What does he say? But in the, a, the, media, the media cut it off. What does he say in A Few Good Men? He's like, people don't, my men don't follow orders and people die. <laughs> right. But, but, but uh, a medic showed up like two seconds, three seconds after the media cut. Right. And therefore, the media is a bunch of garbage. Uh, the media is garbage. They're I a bunch think, of race-baiting garbage. I think a big problem is, too, that at this time – so, you know, when you watch the George Floyd video, you watch the full body cam of what happened. I mean, it, it's very clear that the officers extended him uh, – I would say gratuitous amounts of courtesies in how they were dealing with him. Yeah, but that's him. the more recent video. But, yeah, we but let, me, let me get to my yet. point. You're going, the, no, you're but, hopping but, the rail. But here. let me get to my we point. We can get there eventually. No, but let me get to my point. My point is that if if there was one thing about that incident that I would take exception with, it would be kind of this uh, standing idly by in the face of something that might supersede. Uh, you know, it's a very it's a very deep kind of ideological question versus doing what you're told versus what your obligations are as a human being to somebody else. And no, I think no, no, this... dude, no, 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 no. Because if you're just a cop and your boss says, "Stay in formation," a medic is coming. Right. There's only one correct move, and that's right. to stay in formation because a medic is coming. And you know why? Because you're not a medic. Right. You can't do shit anyways, and a medic's coming. And a medic did come, and a medic came seconds later. So that cop, the cop did everything correct. Everything about that follow-up was correct. Yeah. Everything. 
except they shouldn't have sat him up if they really thought he had a head injury. Uh, this is uh, one of those – this plays to, like, those age-old questions, you know? Like, at the, at, the, at the heart of every good movie about, you know, war or action or adventure, there's always that – there's always that moment where the protagonist is being told to do one thing and his heart is telling him to do another or, you know, in the like in the Matrix, I think of where the guy says you can only do one thing. You know, you can save the woman that you love or you can save the world, but you can't do both. And he says, yeah, well, in this it, case, there was, both, right? there was the right thing and the wrong thing. And when you're and the commander says, stay in formation, a medic is coming. There is only one correct response, right? And I understand and the that. Medic I understand did that come. So, I, so, so your argument doesn't hold any water. None. Well, it holds a little bit. It, of what water it shows you, with what, me. what you're showing is, is that you would be an undisciplined cop. That is that's probably what it, that's what you're probably right, and that's probably a part of the reason I never went into the military or could be a cop, and why I have admiration for a lot of people that do it because I don't, you know, I'm not great at falling into line when it comes to thinking. Right. So that might. So I understand if the cops had literally just kept walking by him and you didn't have the audio. It looked bad. The audio free video looked really bad. Let's see if I can get. But it looked bad for two. No, no, don't bother. We're in the middle of a podcast. What (laughs) What do you mean, don't bother? That's what we're talking about. Well, you can, but anyone can Google it. Right. Okay. All right. Well, everybody Google it after the podcast and. But you got to find the one that has the audio and has the medic showing up. And, and, and again, for the media to cut off the audio and to cut off the arrival of the medic is unconscionable to me. You know why? Because they're race-baiting, click-baiting bastards. Well, that, uh, that I'll agree with you on. Well, but this, they're causing – the media is helping. This is the whole problem with this goddamn movement. The media is helping – foster all the riots and all the civil unrest and making people hate each other yeah the one guy stops and and tries to bend down to help the guy and then the other cop pushes him forward so there's one cop that that stops and and his instinct is to is to go and help the guy and to you know check on him and the other cop pushes him forward as if to say just ignore him just leave him there and i think that's what i took exception with yeah, but he didn't say just ignore him, leave him there. He said, stay in formation, a medic's coming. Yeah, just watching the video, though, that's exactly what that's it, the, that's what and it looks that's like. Why, that, so that's why you can't believe your own lying eyes. This is the, when my brother told me a story, he, he said, I was watching this video of a guy, and he was ranting, and it seemed like it was a Black Lives Matter kind of rant. And then they said, well, if you pan back a little bit and you show a little more of the video, he I, he goes, oh, oh, my God, he's actually not ranting about that. He's ranting about Trump. And then they said, now let's pan back a little more. And he says, oh, my God, he's ranting about Obama. And it shows you that you can slice these videos any way you want. Uh, that I agree with you li- with. Well, but the, 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 so the media are the bad guys. So in that sense, Trump has it right. I, the I, media I, don't, has- I don't disagree with you, but I'm just watching – I'm just. But that, yeah, I'm, but I'm I'm, watching... it's like saying it's in Greek, and you, you're going, yeah, but it looks bad, but I can't understand Greek. What? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter that it looks bad. The truth is that they right. did it exactly right. Right. They did it exactly right. I think it's really difficult too because the, you know, I think the reason that you endured such shit, and I don't know if I'm gonna, if I buy into the union conspiracy or not because i don't know a lot about it but i think also too dave the the climate well, no 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 hold on reddit was covered with the union guys the union conspiracy thing no they were all over this on reddit i was getting killed on reddit okay well by, let, by people i recognize it's besides the point the point that i'm trying to make is that the climate for outrage was at a fever pitch at this point and it got worse because, and right it got worse because a lot of people you know, in a case like this, what do you need, right? Me and you, obviously, we had a disagreement on it at first, but what do we need, right? We need this. Data. We need to. We need to have a dialogue. We need to talk about right. it. We need to examine the facts. We need to do exactly what we're doing right now, and that takes at least whether I'm right and you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong. It takes the wherewithal to understand that you have to be able to step back and communicate about it without getting extraordinarily emotional and flying off That's the handle. Right. 
because you have to have that type of objective examination as a scientist. I'm sure you know that. And I just think that we are, we, at, at the point that this happened, we were at peak, uh, appealing to our emotions and not appealing to the facts. And that I think becomes very dangerous. I think that's well, in personal self-defense. If you look at the tweet that got me in trouble, I was not appealing to my emotions. Right. That's correct. I was saying I and and you remember it was a guarded statement. I said I, I got to take the other side of this one, right? It was with reservation that I was taking the other side, <clears throat> and so I was saying what I'm seeing here, it's not what everyone else is seeing. That's what I do. That's my natural instinct. My yeah. natural instinct is to look for the other side. And by the way, since the media is such a pack of liars, I'm going to be right most of the time. <laughs> I don't disagree with you there, man. I mean, so definitely... now tell me what you think happened with George Floyd. Let's talk George. This is dangerous well, territory. Yeah, but it it has to. We have to talk about it because talk about it. You tell me. Tell me about George Floyd. What did you see in that video? What do you know about it? Well, I know what I saw at. I know how the incident was described before the body cam footage came out. And specifically, I watched an anchor. On let me okay. Let me ask you. So let's clarify here for the, your listeners. There was the footage that we all saw, and everyone declared that George George Floyd was murdered. Everyone. And then what? Two weeks ago. Well, let me finish. No, no. Go ahead. Let me finish. But the body cam footage came out two weeks ago, three weeks. Ago. I know. I, I watched all of it. Let me just. Let well, me... I just want people to know that it's a different footage than the one they watched. Oh, it's very different. But and and. What I was about to say was that I listened to how some there was an anchor on CNN who had seen the body cam footage before the rest of the world did, and I listened to him describe it um, and what the way that he described it versus what actually happened in the body cam footage were two completely different things. What I saw exactly. in the body cam footage was I saw the officers respond to a distressed shop owner who claimed that he had been given counterfeit money. Then I saw right. the officers approach the SUV that George Floyd was in uh, with several other people. I, I did see the officer have his weapon drawn. I saw the officer then holster his weapon once he saw George Floyd's hands. I saw that George Floyd was clearly distressed. He was clearly... Right. He was clearly distressed when the officer started talking to him. He was did not appear to be in his right mind. I saw the people that were with him say to the officers, "He's crazy," or make the uh, you know the, the the finger around the head gesture, like he's losing his mind kind of gesture, whatever. Uh, right. I saw them confirm to the officers that he was on some type of substances. I think I saw the officers you know, get him out of the car. I saw them plead and reason with him to try to get into the back of the police car. Um, I saw him saying, you know, I can't breathe and all these other things long before there was any kind of physical confrontation. See, that's a profound, profoundly important piece yep, of and, information. And we'll, and we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Uh, so I saw all that happen. I saw them try to get him into the back of the police cruiser uh, he refused. I saw him, uh, I saw the police reason and plead with him for w much longer than I think I would have if I was a police officer. It felt like 10 minutes. I know it wasn't, but they were just pleading with him and telling him, Hey, get in the back of the truck, get in the back of the truck. And he's saying, I'm claustrophobic. Never mind the fact that he just got out of an SUV with four other people in it, but he's saying, I'm claustrophobic. So then they start reasoning with him. Say, All right, we'll, we'll roll the windows down for you. We'll exactly. do that for you. We'll do that for you. So I thought the officers were very reasonable with him. I saw them eventually say, hey, this isn't your decision anymore. We're putting you in the back of the fucking police cruiser, um, which is what you have to do uh, when you're arresting somebody. Um, and then I saw him asked to be put on the ground to stay out of the car and to say, all right, well, I'll, I'll go onto the ground or whatever. I saw. And the, did you see the officer showing anger or negative emotion? Not, not at all. Not only did I not see that, I didn't see compassion. I didn't see anything that indicated to me that anything that occurred during the George Floyd arrest involved race. There is not a single shred of evidence that 
that no epithet that said that that incident was motivated by race. In fact, and again, I've said before, I'm not Mr. Pro Police. Okay, I've had bad personal experiences with police. I've had some good ones. I train with a lot of great police officers. At my jiu-jitsu gym, I've also had some very profoundly negative experiences where police officers have lied about things. Uh, one of them hit my mother in a car at one point and ran, running a red light and uh, going over the double yellow lines and then lied about it. So you're you know, not prone to support the men in blue, right? I, I, well, I, I support the job that they do in my local community, definitely. And uh, you know, that's right. But I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm not driving around with a uh, with a, a thin blue line sticker on my car or anything like that. Um, well, because but, you get your car beaten to a pulp. For well, starters. that's yeah, you're right. But I like <laughs> listen, Dave. I like to think that I'm I can stay kind of objective and kind of in the middle right. of, about it and just use reason. And there was nothing on that body cam footage, nothing that showed me that they were not being compassionate to him and not trying to um, not trying to work with him, but for the fact. But for the fact that when they got him on the ground and Chauvin had his knee on the guy's neck, which, by the way, his defense attorney pointed out um, is what they were trained to do. And that's a different topic. That's critical, can, too. Right. No, no, but that's critical. We can talk that's about critical. we can talk about training and these other things, which I think are very important also, too, um, that when he had done that, um, that after he had gone out, after he had passed out, um, then I thought that the idea of the officers kind of standing by and and again this boils down to one of those humanitarian kind of uh forks in the road which is did the officers notice it if they noticed it why did they you know why did they not say something i mean all these questions a lot they of even noticed there. foam coming out of his mouth one guy says that foam and and uh, chauvin supposedly said said look we we got an ambulance is four blocks away right right so uh right. and i'm I'm not a coroner. I can't tell you exactly. I read the family's autopsy report and then the uh, the external autopsy report, one of which said the leading cause was uh, suffocation, and the other one said that the leading cause was uh, cardiopulmonary related to the uh, suffocation. And anybody that's taken jujitsu knows that if you cut off the carotid on both sides of somebody's neck, um, they're going to go out. Um, so you and, and if, I are going to disagree on that point right there, actually. Okay, well, let's I talked to with a that. bunch of jujitsu guys, and it is. And I watch, for example, Joe Rogan talking with Brett Weinstein, and Brett was trying to gently say to Joe, "What you think you saw was this," and and Rogan was missing it. Rogan, I think, is phenomenal. I want to be on Rogan's show. I've said it on every podcast I've ever done. But Rogan occasionally gets into a zone where he can't see he can't see it straight. And Rogan kept saying, no, no, you can see it in the video. And one of the things, Rogan, you can see him putting his weight on the guy. And I'm going, you can't see weight. Let's start with that. So you saw the knee on the neck. And I just learned this the other day. You see the knee on the neck, and it looks like he's putting a huge amount of pressure. But it turns out that during that video, uh, Floyd picked his head up several times and the knee rose with it. And that's fascinating because that means he had his knee as sort of a, a, a restraint, but it wasn't full body weight. Yeah, I disagree with you. I'm looking at photographs of it right now, and I'm looking you at— You can't see it in photographs, dude. It's eight minutes. Well, yeah, but I can also—I mean, I can see—I'm looking at probably one probably one or two dozen different photographs of the incident right now. And the way that the officer is situated right now, and I know what this looks like because I deal with these positions every day I, right. you know, for hours a day. So, I mean, the officer has his knee on the guy's carotid artery on his neck. He's sunk in. He's He's deep on the guy's neck, and he's putting some body weight on it. I mean, so when listen, I stared, I'm not looking at it, nor am I going to look at it. What I saw was the knee on the latter half of the neck. Uh, to me, this looks like a blood choke. Well, so the blood choke has to get both sides. Well, yeah, but the other side of his neck is pressed up against the pavement. I, I don't believe the pavement could do it. Uh, that? Listen. If you've ever been choked, you ever been collar choked? Sometimes you only even need one carotid to choke somebody with a blood choke. I mean, any anybody that's been choked hundreds of times a week that trains. And this I'm at a disadvantage, but I did talk to other jujitsu guys who said they didn't think that was a blood choke, a successful one. 
Mm, no, I would dis- I, I would might, disagree you, strongly. Uh, well, you can, but but again, it's one of those things where ultimately you put it in front of a jury, and you bring in your experts and you look at it carefully, frame by frame, and you ask, was that a blood choke? Yeah, he's got all of his weight on the guy's neck. I'm lo- I'm looking at a, a bunch of different images, forty images. You can't 50 images. you can't look at you got if he lifted his head up three times, four times, whatever the number was then it means he didn't have his full weight on his neck. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. You can scramble and kind of get your neck moving if somebody has. Even if he's got so 60, when, even when if did, he's got, even the, if he's got 60% of his body weight. So, so, so it's about eight minutes. When did, when did it become a fatal choke? So usually what happens is if you watch like a jiu-jitsu tournament or you see uh, a lot of times in MMA fights when guys just won't tap out because they're uh, – right. They're stubborn. Yeah, exactly. They're stubborn. Um, what happens is uh, if you knock the guy out and then immediately let go, the ref steps in and says, all right, you know, you got to let him go. And he gets some blood flow into the brain immediately uh, after right. that. It's nothing. It happens all the time. It happens at, you know, jujitsu super fights. It happens in, you know, IBJJF tournaments because people are stubborn. They don't want to tap, whatever. But then eventually you go to sleep and then, you know, ref comes by and, and you know, you're you're back up and running in like four, five, six. So minutes. how long does a blood choke take to knock you out? Um, how long do you have to have it on? Oh, probably under ten seconds. Right. So for for at least six minutes, it was not a blood choke. Yeah, but he may not have had his knee sunk in correctly. He may not but, have had but, all but, of his body see, weight I'm, on him. I'm trying to get at the point that I think what I'd be looking for. Let's say I was in a jury. What I'd be looking for in the video is a change. I'd be looking for something in the last two minutes that was different than in the first six, which, by the way, he was also talking, so he, he might have had restricted air, but he, you can't talk without air. Yeah. And, and you can be stressed. I don't doubt that the stress of the moment contributed. I don't doubt that uh, at all. And there's no, doubt, there's no doubt that the 11 milligrams of fentanyl he was on didn't help And, didn't and help the either. cocaine and the THC and, the, and the, 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 he was a walking pharmaceutical company. Right, but the the point is, and and well, there's another point. Both autopsy reports got released before the before before the tox report was in. Go ahead. That's a problem. So you think that they will amend? I don't know. What, who knows what they're going to do now? I, I have no idea. The tox report didn't come in till weeks later. I think if you're going to take issue with the George Floyd incident, the it's oh shit sorry if you're going to take issue with the incident for me i have no issue with how the officers handled the incident uh up until that point and right. i also think that there was nothing about the incident that was race related of course i'm not in derek chauvin's head so i don't know what he was thinking but there doesn't seem to be any tangible video evidence of that having said that the the knee on the neck, the way that he has it, the way that I'm looking the at it. The optics were bad. It's yeah, but it's more than optics. I mean, I've been in the position. I know I know what it feels like. I know what the well, choke no, feels no, like. No, 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 no. It's not more than optics if it didn't kill him, right? So so you're assuming the knee on the neck killed him. If I had to guess, I would say that um the combination of things killed him, but the knee on the neck set it off. The knee on the the blood choke to the brain set it off. Set off the well, gun. so what changed about his knee position after six minutes that created the blood choke? Well, I would have to watch the entire video again to I rest my you, case. But... Therefore, therefore, interestingly, there well, what, was what out of the eight minutes, the case that the cop killed him with his knee. Yeah, but what do you mean you rest your case? I mean, I'm looking. I rest my case that you have to watch the video and look for that change. You have to you have to figure out what what changed after eight, after six minutes. Six minutes didn't kill him. Two more minutes somehow did. If if he what had changed? say he had eighty percent of the guys carotid though instead of a hundred percent of it, it may have just taken six minutes for him to go out. I, I, but you said ten seconds, right? I, I, well, I'm just saying. I'm saying if I'm you just, if you I'm get somebody if you give both of this. somebody's carotid arteries, if you put somebody in a rear naked choke and you cut off both carotids, it's ten seconds I, and you're out. That right? and that that's in a perfect world though. Your arms right. sunk in properly. Right. Both carotids right. cut off immediately. But anybody right. that's been in like a bow and arrow choke, which is a jujitsu choke that, you know, a lot of times will just get one collar over one carotid or, uh, you know, a choke where uh, somebody's doing a, a one arm rear naked choke and then they're doing the, uh, 
the the pressure on the other side of your neck. I forget what it's called, but almost like you're starting a lawnmower, but you're not really cutting off the other carotid right. as the primary way to choke them. Anybody that's been choked a million times and knows all the different, knows sometimes, hey, it takes 10 seconds. Sometimes it takes 20, 30. Sometimes you can sit when somebody's got a fully locked in triangle. You can sit so there let me and ask you this for question. two minutes before it happens. So his claims, I can't breathe, they're not relevant? Well, breathing and... Well, I'm, I'm asking, are his claims, I can't breathe, not part of the, not part of the homicide? I don't really know because he so breathe so this is a blood choke it's not a breathing choke that's number one I know uh, that's what I'm trying to get at right so and you're saying the I can't breathe is not part of the homicide I'm saying that if I had to guess the fact that Which he is, was saying I can't breathe before the incident took place before the knee on the neck incident and combined with the fact that this would be a blood choke and not a uh, windpipe choke not a breath choke uh, right. I would not I would not give that as much credence, I think, as it's being given. As a nun. Well, he had been saying I can't breathe prior to being put on the ground. I'm just trying I'm just trying to make sure we're clear on this point because that body cam image, which showed up two or three weeks ago, could you explain to me why it took two or three weeks of rioting in every city in the country for that body cam to show up? No, I think if that had shown up a lot earlier, it would have saved a lot of personal property. Conceivable. And... I don't know why you'd sit on that. I, I agree with you there. It paints a very different picture, man, than, than what the media told us. Right. And so, so, so now we've got this problem, which, you know, no one – doubts that there's racism in the country I, the, the the magnitude and how it manifests itself can be doubted i as a white guy i'm not qualified to understand you know what pissed me off i think i think i'm just guessing if i were black which is totally hypothetical what would piss me off is listening to a bunch of white guys talk about what my life is like right I, I can't imagine how infuriated I would be listening to some hipster on some college campus ranting about <laughs> my life as a black guy. I'd be going, would you just shut up? Some, ni right? some 19 year old that's never worked in yeah. their lives and have grown up in a wealthy Someone, family, silver spoon. Uh, this, that would drive me crazy. It's like, it's like, excuse me, that's our cross to bear. And, and we've had to live with this. And, and, and you don't understand either. You don't understand any more than that guy who, doesn't agree with you for Christ's right. sake. So you got to be black to understand what life in the U S is like being black. And, and, and it reminds me when Bill Maher got in trouble for the N word and, and, and then he had ice cube on the next week to do an apology. And, and ice cube said, that's our word. And, and in many ways that made total sense to me. I keep saying, we, this is our world. This is the world we live in. This is ours, not yours. And, and, and with respect to racism and systemic racism, I'm happy to listen to some. I, I've, I've only witnessed really seriously overt sort of, but the subtle kind of racism a couple of times. So I was with a, a group and there's one black guy in the group and someone singled him right out and say, Hey, what are you doing here? And, I, and we, we all said, he's with us. And I was, I was really shocked by it. I, I guess that's how privileged I am, but uh, but so, so I don't I don't I th I think that I want to hear from the blacks about Black Lives Mattering, right? And and I, I'm I'm happy to hear from white guys saying you know what can we do to help you here? I just don't want to hear from a 19 year old Marxist that right. doesn't even know what Marxism is. They don't know what they're right. fighting for. They've never been oppressed and they don't understand what they're doing. Those are the people they're I They're looking for a cause. They're right. looking for well, a cause. Well, yeah, they're looking for, I think more importantly, they're looking for ways to deal with insecurities about themselves and deal with personal problems. And it manifests in this virtue signaling. And hey, to some degree, man, I participated in that when I was in my late teens and early 20s. Well, what's also true is I've been, for years, I've been writing about the fact that these badasses on Wall Street and these, I've, you know, I've written about police brutality probably five times. I have not been oblivious to police brutality. I've written all about police brutality maybe four, but possibly five times over the last dozen years. But, 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 but I think 
the, what we're picking up is people are pissed off in, a, in the most general way. And they're pissed off because they realize their futures are kind of bleak. Right. They realize that their job opportunities suck compared to what they thought they were going to get. And they realize that their quarter million dollar education isn't going to buy them a, a, a job that doesn't require wearing a paper hat and shoving food <laughs> through a window. Right? And, 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 and that they, what they should have done is gone and learned how to repair elevators or something, right? Yeah. But, um, so I think that I think the outrage and, and you watched uh, Dave Chappelle's I think it's called 836 video that's the number of that's the 8 minutes 36 seconds of the tape of George Floyd I think I, I watched part I, of it I could yeah. have I could be but off by a, a little it. bit of a number but but Chappelle although I disagree with some of the facts he quoted did a truly astounding job of catching the rage and I'm going, holy crap, that was eye-opening to watch. Chappelle's, I think it's 836. I'm not sure. And, uh, and so I get all that. Now, here's where I want to take you next. All right. And that is, what about the weird aspects of Floyd's video? And I don't want to go back of what a punk he was. And stuff. I mean, we all know he's a punk. It doesn't mean you should execute him, right? So no doubt that no matter how many convictions he has, you don't get to choke him to death, right? No question about that. But there are weird parts of this case that we have not talked about yet. Let's do it. Number one, he and Chauvin knew each other. Right. They knew it. They worked together in a nightclub doing security, not a big nightclub. This is not like the Aria in Vegas. This was a small nightclub. They worked together in doing, <laughs> doing security, right? Weird topic number two. So, um, Floyd was trying to pass a fake $20 bill. He, didn't, he wasn't caught shoplifting. He was trying to pass a fake $20 bill. That's a little on the weird side to me. Uh, you know, I, when I go to... When I go. Well, when I go to uh, convenience stores and stuff, they pull out the pen and they mark the, the the bill to see if it's authentic. Yeah. I say, do you ever do you ever find inauthentic ones? Does anyone? They go, no. One of my students works for the Treasury Department on on off, and he works in the division of counterfeiting. And it, you know who's produced the best U.S. currency? The North Koreans. I believe That's that. That's a weird one. That's bizarre. Um, so in any event, so he's trying to pass a fake $20 bill. He didn't try to steal 20 He didn't try to shop with 20 Fake $20 bill. That's a little weird. Why is it weird? Because people don't pass fake $20 bills because no one I've ever asked yes, said do. anyone ever you've, tried. You've never, lived in the, you've never lived in the fucking hood, Dave. That's the problem. Well, I have lived in the hood, but 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 that's a separate issue. If you, if, and just you know, spend some but, time. But at, bear with at me; I'm not done. That thing goes 58th somewhere. Fifty-eighth and Chestnut, or that goes somewhere. So you know, so he gets he gets. I've caught seen people do thing. a lot crazier things and try to pass a twenty-dollar okay. bill. If you bear hand, with if, me. if you hand somebody a fake twenty that looks like a that's real twenty, that's not a dead end. I'm taking you on. All right, that's all not right, a dead right. end. All right, I'll shut okay? up. Okay, so he gets in a car with three other people. What do we know about the other three? What do I know? Anyone. I what know, does anyone I don't know, know about anything. The, Nothing. Zero. Nothing. No interviews of them, nothing. Does that seem weird to you? Um, not particularly. The because... biggest social movement in history in this country. Yeah, but they did what they were told. They got out. They stood against the wall. They, you know, I, I don't. So, so no, there, no, they didn't. They didn't. Did they? He did. Didn't they get out of the vehicle, though, at one point? I don't it, think and so. And then they were put up against the wall at the convenience store where they were? Maybe, maybe. I, I've never... But if I were an intrepid reporter, I'd be trying to talk to those guys. There ought to be a lot of people trying to talk to those guys. We yeah, know you nothing. might be right. They, they might be in okay. the middle of book deals, okay, though. So we don't let's, even know. Let's take this a step further. Okay. The nightclub owner talked about Floyd and Chauvin working together. And my bullshit, this is when my bullshit detector went up. There's usually <laughs> some event. There's usually some event and one of these weird things where I go, wait a minute, that's not even right. There's some event. And when she got interviewed, my bullshit detector soared and said she's lying. Why is she lying? As soon as someone starts lying, I'm going, why is she lying? 
And, and, and what she's doing, she's getting interviewed. She says they worked overlap for about a year. And then she says, well, I, I don't know if they ever actually met each other. And I'm going, the nightclub's about, about, about a thousand square feet. This is not a big nightclub. And she's saying she doesn't know if they've met each other, having worked there together for a year. And then, and, so, and then she starts babbling about Chauvin having a hair trigger. And she's, it's this owner. And she said, you know, and every time everything got tricky, bought the pepper spray and blah, blah, blah. And she's talking about the shit that Chauvin would do and that it really wasn't good at all. Chauvin worked there for 17 years. Would you keep an employee for 17 years if they had a hair trigger? No. And then, and then, and then, if you worked at a nightclub for 17 years, don't you think you'd lose the hair trigger? Well, that's what happens. I mean, at least if you're a semi-conscious person, you work as a bartender or a bouncer long enough, you understand that. Been there, done that, you know, right? Being past, oh yeah, you know. I, I right, was, so, so her story is full of crap. Well, yeah, but we don't know that that's definitively full of crap because it is possible. Well, that you Floyd, can say that, but I, if I were betting Floyd, a paycheck, I would take you to the cleaners on the bet that are you might, full of crap. You might, but it's my job to play devil's advocate. And the, the right? point of the matter is if Floyd was only there for a year and Floyd worked, so, so, you know, so then, two, Tuesday, Thursday, and, and shopping work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I there is a chance. I can't confirm any of this. Okay. But there's rumors that that particular nightclub – has ties with money laundering, which there's two kinds, right? There's the kind where you take illicit profits and turn them into legal profits, right? Like gumball machines. And I think every nightclub probably does that. And, uh, but there's also the kind of maybe they're laundering fake $20 bills. I don't know. I mean, I didn't and read maybe, anything about maybe that. Maybe old George, maybe George did something kind of stupid, like he dipped into some till of some kind. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I don't know anything about that. And then, last but not least, intelligence. The claim is that my club had intelligence ties. And that, that I have zero, zero support for besides the fact that I've seen it asserted. That's it. Now, be real nice to dig into that nightclub, right? Find out what happened. Yeah. Maybe do a little investigate. It was such a shame it burned down. This says they uh, they bumped heads. A uh, man who worked at the same club with George Floyd and Derek Chauvin and previously told CBS News that the two had bumped heads. Oh, he changed his story Wednesday, saying he had mistaken Floyd for another unnamed African American employee. Interesting. Right. And so, so, you know, the bullshit detector keeps getting pinged here, right? What's that? The bullshit detector keeps getting hit here. Oh, change the story. Yeah. I mean, these other facts are almost like irrelevant though. No, they're not when they, when, you know, it's like when you're talking to your teenager and, and he, and you say, where'd the dent in the car come from? And all of a sudden the story starts getting crazier and crazier and crazier. You know, (laughs) he's lying. Right. And so I, I agree, none of these data points by themselves say anything. None of these data points, th- these data points in aggregate, don't nail some coffin close. I should use another metaphor. Don't seal the case. But why did, for example, Floyd and his buddy sit in the car in front of the store after having been caught trying to pass a $20 bill and not drive away? Well, they, they may not have known that they had been caught. Maybe not. You've got an explanation for everything, but every one of these is a little weird. It's, it, it, but it's it's not. It's not weird unless uh, you know we can prove that he was sitting out there for another reason. But he may, he just may not have known he'd been caught. He may have passed the bill, and then the you know shop what this owner... reminds me of when OJ's blood type came out, and it was a certain blood type, and the defense said, you know, there's forty thousand people in Los Angeles who have that blood type. Right. And you go, therefore, what does that mean? And and someone said, yeah, they weren't married to her. <laughs> right? The, the, my point, there's no, this is not like the old man. I, I lay down a paycheck that the old man, There's that story's wrong. This is not like that. 
but it is one of those things that troubles me. And, and what I think, what also I think the role of the George Floyd murder was it was a trigger. So people make it seem like, you know, it is about George. I, I don't think it was. I think there was, if, if not George, it was going to be someone else was going to trigger. In fact, we've already seen it, right? Well, There's other cases that I, have triggered. I agree with you. I think that one of the most disturbing things about it was that this response that is being attributed to outrage about systemic racism comes from an incident where there doesn't seem to be any tangible right. evidence that race was involved. But I think that socioeconomic pressure, and this is something that, you know, I see too. I mean, I see it in West Philly. I see it in South I Philly. Totally I totally agree. It in North Philly. I think the socioeconomic pressure that has come from widening the inequality gap over the last 20 years mixed 40. with the pandemic and keeping everybody at home and really putting people under severe financial distress that are already under severe financial distress. I think that, like you said, this was the straw that broke the camel's back in a lot of ways. And, and, it, and it won't be 100 years before we know, before we have some psychologists look back at everything. And, you know, oh, it'll take a long studies. time to understand this period. Right, exactly, time. exactly. But I... I just I just find it difficult to believe that the widening of the inequality gap thanks to our friends at the Federal Reserve and their policy in part I always blame them right <laughs> has not played a a huge role in the uproar that has happened nationwide and and all of this uh civil unrest yeah and they don't even either know it or will never admit it but um yeah so so i think the george floyd george floyd case was a trigger not a cause and i think um and, and there's a, a huge the, the psychologists will be writing phd theses on what actually has gone down right. in these riots and you know i've i've for example tried to understand the anatomy of a riot Hold on, let me just, I'm going to get something. It'll only take me a second. Yeah, and I'm going to grab a beer. I'll give you two minutes, all right? So I've thought about Dave, it. Dave, Dave, yeah. I'm, I'm grabbing a beer real quick, okay? Give me one sec. No problem. Okay, Dave, we're back, and you said that you were uh, trying to understand the anatomy of a riot a second ago. Yeah, so I've watched these riots. One thing that got me in a bit, one of the complaints from the uh, the cancellation team, the, the cancellation culture, was that I, I, at one point, one of the tweets, I said, look, I'm getting really tired of this riot, these riots, and they go, well, we don't really care, right? Um, but I've been, I've been staring at the riots, and, and, and everyone plays a role interestingly enough and there's a lot of different roles being played in the riots so you've got the you've got the passionate you know black lives matter guys who are who are there you know protesting what what they're to the depths of their heart they believe and then you've got um you've got the the, the hipsters who are there to feel better about themselves um i blame the cell phone crowd i think they play a role that they don't think they play a role but um you know, the, the reason you have curfews is so that the honest, good people don't clog up the street so that you can deal with the bad guys. Right. And so so when you fill up a, a protest that, that's you – know, if you protest at noon in the middle of, you know, the middle of uh, 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 some – highly lit area um you're not contributing you're exercising free speech if you're out if you're out at 12 o'clock at night in the middle of portland you're you're actually part of the trouble and um and 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 the, the cell phone crowd adds numbers they add cover for the bad actors and they they think they're there and they don't they don't understand that no the, that's a critical part because if it was just you know state skateboard toting antifas the cops would catch them around them up and deal with them well, maybe not in Portland, but in most cities, maybe not in most cities. I don't even know anymore. But, well, what um, do you think about what do you think about this idea of uh, socioeconomic inequality attributing to this? Well, it's absolutely. I've been writing about this. You know, I've been writing about this for a dozen years. I, you know, I, I, you know. I even used a quote out of a Denzel Washington movie, The Debaters, and it said, "Look, you better hope that passive. Uh, better hope that uh, what's that called? Where you?" I can't remember the term for it where you uh, – civil disobedience. You better hope that civil disobedience works because the alternative is much worse. 
And, and, and so I, I think that we've got an entire generation that has every right to be mad at what the hell they're looking forward to. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's worse, you know, certainly worse the the further down the socioeconomic ladder you go. And, uh, and, and so everyone's pretty mad. And, and then on top of that, you throw the, the fact that we were all sheltering. And so there was a standing army of protesters, right? Yeah, most, that's right. most, most times, in fact, this might not have even happened. George Floyd could, could have been killed and had to go away conceivably, but there was, there were 350 million people kind of sitting around choking the chicken, wondering what to do. And they go, well, I'm going to go and protest for Christ's sakes. Right. And they're, and they're mad about being sheltered, right? Even if they believe that the virus could kill them and the sheltering is the right thing, they're still mad that they're stuck here. <laughs> And they're staring at the four walls, and, you know, there's probably divorce courts uh, filling up as we it's speak. Like, it's like you said before about the actor with the five million followers that is, you know, talking about you and retweeting you. It's like, well, what's going on in their life that, you know, Dave Colum becomes the priority? And it's the same thing here. It's right. like all of a sudden you, you remove anything interesting from these people's lives, and they're just looking around for something to do. Well, supposedly, for example, the uh, – you know, in, in these cities where they're they're selectively rounding up, I, I do believe the, the cops are attempting to find the real troublemakers. I've seen videos where where you can watch them bypass. There's this one really interesting one where a guy's trying to dig up pieces of uh, cobblestone or something out of the street with a hammer. And all of a sudden, this one guy tackles him. And a bunch of other guys jump on him, and they usher him over to the cops and he gets ushered through the line of the cops and dealt with. And, 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 and along with this guy is some young, you know, hooded black garbed Antifa wannabe kid. I'm guessing sort of hanging on a guy trying to retrieve him from getting taken to the cops. And it was almost heartwarming where, where the guy gets pushed through the line, the kids holding on to him. And one of the cops grabs the kid by the scruff of the neck and sort of pulls him over, shoves him back over to the other side, say, go home. The cop didn't want him. They wanted the guy who was trying to chip the stones out of the ground. Now, the other interesting thing is the storyline was that um, was that the protesters were cleaning up their own problems. And I watched, I go, no, those are plainclothes policemen. That the, 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 it was a perfectly orchestrated takedown. And how I knew it was the, the guy who took him down first. Now, if you if you were the first guy on the scene, you took him down, right? You think this guy shouldn't be doing this. You take him down, a bunch of other guys help you. You're going to finish the job, aren't you, right? You're going to make sure he gets to the cops. Right. The guy who took him down, as soon as the other guy showed up, he scampered away. He was the point man. Hmm. Interesting. And so, so, so I think the cops immediately started putting, putting, putting people into the crowds, paying close attention, wearing backpacks, you know, the whole thing, and looking for trouble spots. And so I think that the cops are trying to pick up the Antifa. Now, here's an interesting question, though, and I, I'm getting increasingly discouraged by, by the unwillingness of our system to respond to bad guys. Um, I, I, is the FBI trying to figure out who are the real bad guys here or not? Because there are real bad guys here, in my opinion. There, there are, you know, there, are, there's a brainstem to this anarchist movement. And what's the brainstem? I don't know. Right, put it. Th- let me put it this way: you got to have if money, was, right? Yes, absolutely. Bricks are coming from somewhere. The, the, a lot of stuff is showing up. Um, truckloads of people are being bussed in. People are being flown in. And we know the 19-year-old Marxist dorks don't have any money. That's right. So so let me put it this way. If these riots were going on in, say, <laughs> Yugoslavia, would you in any way, shape, or form doubt that our CIA guys are swirling around the perimeter? Oh, I don't fucking know, Dave. Not a chance, right? So, so why you would somehow think that riots in U.S. cities have in no way, you know, sort of our enemies of the United States. I hate to say enemies, it seems too strong, but, but our opponents are not somehow in there. And, the, you know, the catch-all is George Soros. I don't know if it's George Soros. George Soros is a metaphor. But, 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 but if you're China, are, are you really going to just watch us do this and in no way, shape, or form? 
Well, to me, I gotta, I gotta tell you, man, when this, when this all kind of happened, there were a few things that happened in concert, right? First, we got the news about the pandemic. All right. And that was the beginning of the year. Then the George Floyd incident happened. Uh, Then the, you know, the Jacob Blake incident happened. And then we're seeing all this civil unrest. And then at the same time, China starts playing economic hardball. And actually, remember the Saudis and the Russians uh, decided mm-hmm. they were going to flood the market with oil. We had that crazy yep. month yep. where the oil futures yep. contracts that, went down. And it happened within negative. two days of each other. Yeah, yep. exactly. And on CNBC, they were like, well, uh, you know, it's certainly, uh, I don't know. Unfortunate. I don't want to, yeah, it's unfortunate. I don't want to say it's uh, it's related. I'm like, of course it's fucking related, you morons. Like, you think uh, Saudi a- Arabia and Russia just picked any old time to come out and say, all right, well, we're going to turn the oil spigot on. They could have done this any time over the last 20 years without issue, but America's got energy independence, and they it's saw like they all hell was the breaking big, loose. It's like they can see the bid stack. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. And now you got this whole thing. The Global Times said last week, our China's thinking about dumping their treasury bills and stuff. You know, this shit is not by accident. Okay. Nothing is by accident. It's not yeah. by accident that these, you know, superpowers are trying to do this now. I mean, because so here's cult- one that's not by accident. We don't need to go here, but I just want to point it out. Remember the uh, judge whose whose husband got whose son got killed and husband got got seriously wounded by uh yeah. by supposedly a white supremacist, right? Who 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 first the, the guy shot him and then and then they found him and they said he he was a lawyer but he was a white supremacist. I'm going, you know, there are probably lawyers who are white supremacists, but I always kind of thought they were kind of down the social economic ladder. Uh, maybe it's a bias. Um, and then you start finding out. You go, oh, by the way, um, the judge had just been handed a case um, having to do with money laundering. And that the money laundering case included a number of cases, including oh wait a minute, what's his name again? Epstein. Normal. And then you find, and then you find out that the lawyer who was the white supremacist also had worked for Kroll, which is this basically uh, uh, Blackwater-like intelligence group that's into everything. And you go, wait a minute, I, I, I can't put the story together. Like, I can't put together the Epstein story. I can't put together, but I can tell you there's enough pieces laying on the ground that spook the crap out of me. Yeah. And so these things are happening all the time. And then and then you just saw, what, is it yesterday or two days ago, we find out that Mueller's top echelon, his team, as well as guys like Peter Strzok and various characters like that, at the end of the Mueller investigation, they all scrubbed their phones. They scrubbed them. Normal. Normal activity, right? Normal and, and stuff then, going on here. And then when you read about it, you find out, well, several of them claim that they have a security <laughs> thing that says if you try to log in too many times, the phone self-destructs. Yeah. And, and, and you have to log, and supposedly you have to log in wrong 10 times or the phone self destructs. And suppose these nitwits that happened to who, everybody. Were, who were in the intelligence world somehow just couldn't remember their password yeah. 10 times in a row. Normal. Normal, right? Just so, like, so in, remember like Inspector, all the time you remember gets, the cartoon Inspector Gadget? He would always get the, uh, yeah. he'd always get the instructions from the chief. And then he had like four seconds to flush him down the toilet before they exploded. That was like the running gag on every episode. <laughs> they would always explode it's, it's, too soon. So there's this guy I, I have contact with. I'm going to ask him. And there's, uh, he's a general. And I, am, I haven't asked him yet, but I'm going to ask him, has the system become just one gigantic crime syndicate? Right, and I think the answer is yes. So I think well, the answer. Look at is, the central banks. Right, but 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 you look at the, uh, the the Russia collusion story. If you still think Russia collusion w- was was a Trump problem and not a problem with Comey and Strzok and these guys, you you just been under a rock at this point. I Even agree guys with like that. They're Jonathan already blaming. Turley's they're blaming. It, everyone is. They're blaming the 2020 result on Russia already, and it hasn't even happened. Right, and, and and the Russians. So, so the Russia collusion story. There were five hundred thousand articles written on the internet, apparently, on Russia collusion, and 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 the whole thing turns out to have been wrong, just flat out wrong. Now, the million dollar question is: Will Durham get some heads? Right. 
He got some guy named Klein Smith or something. Yeah, no, no, He's no. a but lightweight. Big heads, right? big heads. If if Durham comes out with nothing, then it means the whole thing is a ruse. Right. And now the Democrats it's are like, setting up for a contested like, election. Holy shit. The Democrats are setting up for a civil war by doing that. If Durham comes out and doesn't get anybody else, it'll be like the movie Burn After Reading. Which is basically, Pre you know, John Corzine, like, right? Pre like John a two, Corzine, a two-hour-long clusterfuck. And the last scene in the movie is a guy at the CIA, and he says to another guy, he's like, "Well, what did we learn from this experience?" And the guy's like, well, I, "I have no idea, you know, just just make it go away." Well, like, just, well remember, I think it's the movie was it Arlington Road or something, where some guy figured out his neighbor, Tim Robbins was a terrorist of some kind and he's he's tracking him down and in the end Tim Robbins ends up framing the guy for blowing up a building. Oh, I don't know. I, don't, I never saw that And then the newspaper one. article show up and the guy had been out of his mind. You know, he'd been really agitated lately and his family was concerned and, and that was it. So the bottom line is there's just uh, George Friedman, for, founder of Stratfor, former Cornell PhD actually, says this is a gigantic chess match and don't underestimate any of the players. Yeah. My favorite. And that's, Go ahead. No, that's, that, that's important. So if you somehow think the guys in Afghanistan are lightweights, you're dreaming. They might look different, but, but, but everyone's playing, playing a very high stakes game here. I don't doubt that. I'm looking at a article about this girl in New York city who was part of a group of people that caused a hundred thousand dollars in damage uh, from Foley Square up to Twenty Fourth Street. This is according to the New York Post. This was last week. Uh, one of the Black Lives Matter protesters facing felony rioting and misdemeanor graffiti charges after a window smashing free for all in Manhattan is a wealthy Upper East Sider whose mother is an architect and whose father is a child psychiatrist. And the, there's a picture of this, you know girl she's 20 years old she obviously had a good upbringing she was uh participating in looting and rioting in a protest organized by the new african black panther party dave and the revolutionary <laughs> abolitionist movement now if you're farrakhan aren't you aren't you like offended that this woman this girl this 20 year old well, so this rich girl is like participating in this well there's some video out there showing a, a black lives matter protest and one of the organizers who I put in the category of I'm here for a reason and I'm here because I believe what I'm doing is saying everybody go home we've got a curfew this is and, and there shit starting to happen and she goes this is not why we're here this is not what we stand for and and so she realizes that the Black Lives Matter protests which start out with a cause have been totally commandeered. There's this great quote. I can't remember from whom it was, but I'm going to use it. I've written it down. I've got it. It says, every movement becomes a business and ends up as a racket. Right. And that, you, you see it over and over and over. The, 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 the Tea Party, right? The Tea Party that sort of spun out with it without warning is now the Republican branch, the, the Tea Party branch or the Republican Party. They just got right. reabsorbed. They just got reabsorbed. They're now just called, oh, yeah, those are the Tea Partiers, but they're ours. Going back to uh, to Epstein, did you watch the Netflix documentary or no? On what? On, On Epstein? Epstein? Yeah. Uh, my wife did. I asked her, I said, did at any point did they mention any famous people who are pedophiles? And she said, no, I said it's a cover. Oh, well, they definitely did. The best part. Who did they the, talk about? The, the best part in that whole documentary is they have Epstein's, like, gardener from his island out uh, out in the Virgin Islands or wherever his island was. And uh, yeah, right. they, they bring this guy in who's, you know, was his groundskeeper for 10 years or whatever. Right. He saw a few things. Oh, yeah. And he says, and this is just the most credible thing I have ever seen. He says right on camera, you know, oh, yes, uh, I saw Bill Clinton on the uh, steps of the mansion all the time. Uh, you know, and the guy's like, are you sure it was Bill Clinton? Oh, yes, President Bill Clinton. You know, he was always here. And the guy, he yeah, all, but we he, all know that. So they don't have to, they, we, we all know Prince Andrew's a, a dumpster fire too. But Epstein Black Book had a thousand names. I know. 
Zehud Barak been outed in a serious way? Right, we know he's involved. Has he been outed? Right, there's all sorts of players in this this fantasy island of his. What do you think Fort will happen with uh, Galen? I I don't know, but I think uh, your your podcaster Whitney uh, Webb seems to think that she's going to get a slap on the wrist and let go. She does, yeah. Whitney will be on next week too, so I'll have to ask her again about it. If anything, she's going to tell it. you that she's been charged with a crime from 1990. G- Ghislaine Jizz, Jizz, let's just call her Jizz. <laughs> J- Jizz has been charged with a crime from 1997. Yeah, and it's not even, it's not even like sexual molestation Nothing. of a minor. It's like, tra- so, so, and it's how like is the media trafficking the a minor over state lines that, or something. Yeah, the media selling is that, that Jizz was j- charged with providing, providing young girls... To, to Epstein, right? That you cannot trivialize the Epstein scandal any more than that. You cannot trivialize it more than that. And so, so again, the theme that keeps emerging is that the Panama Papers. We've talked about them in the past, right? All of a sudden, yeah. there's twenty five thousand famous people globally who have Cayman Island accounts. That story lasted about two days. Right. (laughs) Right? Yeah, that's true. We know that Bill Clinton rode the Lolita Express. I will give you five to one odds that he doesn't ever get arrested. No bet. (laughs) No bet. Right? Prince Andrew, what a mess. What a dumpster fire he is, right? Nothing's going to happen besides the fact that he looks like an idiot. (laughs) And here's an here here's a counter argument. I'm going to make a counter argument. I've seen a lot of pictures of these young damsels, and they this is this is risky stuff. Careful. They, they don't <laughs> careful unhappy, column, but, but but they don't look unhappy. I've been I've been looking I've been looking in their faces, trying to trying to see something. To say, if I saw that person, I would realize there was a problem. Is there um, something? There? You know what? They they may have thought they were happy at the time, but you got to understand. No, no, I when totally you're... disagree with the idea. I I totally get that. I've been trying to I've been trying to look for uh, Stockholm syndrome or something to ask. Right. Can you see it? Can you see it in their faces? Can you see it in their eyes? I haven't been able to spot it. Yeah, and, I, um, I always look at that photo of uh, Prince Andrew with uh, Virginia. Yeah, I know. We've uh, all seen Jufre that a thousand times. And, you know, she she looks like she's smiling and she's happy. But you have to understand, I mean, these, these girls, first off, they're minors. They, they're not – they haven't they're matured also gullible. intellectually. They're extremely gullible. They've been groomed by people that are, you know, experts at grooming. No, no, you know, I, hey, listen, I, I, I when I was that. When I was fucking 18 years old, I would have – I don't even want to tell you what I would have done for ten thousand dollars, you know, because it seems like you know, the I'm most amount sure of money you have to qualify it. by being eighteen. I think you could probably. Yeah, yesterday <laughs> you would not know what I would have yesterday. done for ten thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah, but 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 the point is, I mean, you know, two hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, whatever. You know, they think that they're they're crushing it. I just don't think you can make that argument. I I don't even think you want to. No, go no, there. no. I, and I I agree. I agree. And in fact, it also, by the way, even if they were willing accomplices, society long ago decided they can't be willing right, accomplices. Right, because of their age. Exactly. Right. They're, the minors can't make that decision. Right. And, and, and we've all decided. We've all agreed upon that. And so, so, but I've been, I still, I, I'm a, I've been looking for evidence of, of, uh, of you know, sort of save me expression on their face or something. I, I don't know what. I've, I've I've been trying to find it. I haven't been able to find it. I've been also I've been also waiting for one of them to say, by the way, here are the other guys. But I think they they could be deathly afraid of getting whacked. Yeah. I mean, what what's the history of the guy? So Kevin Spacey's involved here, right? He was a picture of him and Jizz on the on the <laughs> thrones and in Buckingham Palace. That was a tasteful picture, and um. And, uh, and 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 he had some serious accusations against him. Do you remember what happened? No. You remember what happened? No. The, what there happened? were four people. Serious accusations. No, I remember Three. that Spacey got was involved with being with a minor yeah. he was accused of. Right. Of, of the four people who accused him, three died, and one said, "Fuck it, I'm out of here." Ah, uh, I remember reading that that some of the accusers had. Just unfortunately, unfortunate. uh, expired. What are the as odds they say of drowning in, in your research? own toilet? I just wouldn't have thought that was possible, right? 
who knows? I don't know how they died, but if three of your four accusers die in one bail, there's a message there, right? Yeah, well, you know, you want to play the uh, the percentages on that one as a statistician, as a scientist. Here will be the test. Does Hollywood bring him back? That's a good question. I don't think they can. I mean, Hollywood's already out of control. They're already crazy. Well, I agree. This, this thing on uh, Netflix, the uh, the show with the 11-year-old girls, is just... Uh, what is this? I haven't heard of this one. Oh, well, they just debuted. It's it's supposedly it's an award winning movie. Um, about what? It's about young girls that um, join up and start to dance together. They start like doing like twerking and all these other like sexualized. So, so dances. it's for pervs, is what you're saying. Well, okay, you want pervs? Anyone listening? Okay. <laughs> If you're listening, you're sitting in front of a computer. I just don't think it's tasteful. I don't. Are think you sitting in front of a computer? Am I? You are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course I am. Okay. We're recording the podcast. Right. Search. Go to Google. All yeah. those who are listening, I'll speak nice and slowly. Open up Google. Search Tony Podesta. Oh Christ! Art collection. Yeah, we've already done this on on the Whitney Webb podcast. It's fucking insane what these guys have in their house. If I mean, the, if, the borderline if, on if, the abstract in the art world versus just being a fucking creep. No, no, no. It is total perversion. Mm -hmm. It's not borderline anything. It is so deeply embedded in total perversion. It's not normal. It is. It's what not these not guys normal. Have up in it's their house. one of these things where you would you would start probing that guy's personal life so fast. Immediately, you saw those right. paintings. Right. Tony Podesta. Remember Pizzagate? That was supposed to involve the Podestas. Search Tony Podesta art collection. You guys who are listening to this podcast, tell me he's not a perv. A yeah, total it's... perv. I'm not just talking liking young boys. I am talking one sick bastard. I agree. It's awful I saw stuff. Whitney Webb it's brought it to my awful. attention it's the last podcast we did, and I, yeah. I Googled it. I thought it was absolutely crazy. I mean, I just it's can't imagine. It's unbelievable stuff. So, so we're back. We're circling around here, except for the message being right. is that stuff is happening in the old days. Let's, let's assume this has been <laughs> happening message, forever. The message is that stuff is happening. But, but, but let's say this has been happening forever. But now it's happening in a world where we can find it and it spreads quickly, right? And so you can find out quickly that something's wrong with this murder or something's wrong with this murder or something, you know, or that the Clinton body count is now up to 160 or whatever the number is. Um, and, 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 and that, that Clinton's 1120 pardons were all drug lords and money launderers. We we know that it's public record, and 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 then the question is, and so what? So now instead of trying to hide it and and get away with it, they just control the narrative as long as MSNBC and CNN don't touch it, they get away with it. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with you at all. So I, I think we do have a big crime syndicate. I think it's – and so so here's where – this brings us now back to Trump. Well, they have the financial means, don't they? I mean they have the well, – the, the financial the means are unlimited. If you own the central banks, your financial means are unlimited. It's, well, so it, take it's such Dominic Strauss-Kahn, right? All of a sudden he gets charged with rape. He's, that guy's been banging and raping women for years presumably. But someone wanted him out of there, and so then he gets charged, right? When someone gets charged and convicted and dealt with, it means that someone wanted him out of there. It doesn't mean they caught him. Right, they pissed off the wrong person. You know, if you look at – if you find the – by the way, it used to be trivial to find Clinton uh, – you, you find any presidential pardon. It was a website. They were all there. You go to Clinton pardons. You find all these things. What got me to look one day – was when a newscast, a local newscast, I think, were talking. Remember Mark Rich, the financier of the Clinton pardon, and the Republicans went bananas. And they said, oh, I can't believe you pardoned Mark Rich, and this and that. And they went after him, and they made this big deal out of it. And Mark Rich was his financier, and he, he never came back from Europe, so he would have had to have been extradited. So it's this big political hay being made. And I'm watching this newscast. 
and the person says, oh, you know, he's pardoned other people. He went through these various, they went through these various pardons, a dozen of them. One of them was some guy, I don't know, named Jesus or something. He was in prison for, 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 for having been caught with 800 kilos of cocaine. Clinton pardon. Now, I get it when he pardons his cronies and this 800 kilos of cocaine. And here's the problem. The Republicans did not go after that one. Why? I don't know. The answer is because it's like when dogs are pretending to fight. Show all the teeth you want, no blood. When dogs are playing in the yard, it can look it can look ferociously. There's teeth right. na- gnashing, right. no blood, mm-hmm. right? Because you know why? It's like it's like if you bean a baseball, a batter. You don't bean a batter because the next inning, your guys are going to get beaned. That's right. And that's why they have enforcers in hockey. And so the bottom line is, these guys all agree. Look, we will make all sorts of shit but no blood with the exception in my opinion of Trump because he was the guy no one saw coming. That's true. Now I, I've been wavering. I don't know if Trump just sort of showed up. He is somewhere between this crazy bastard who showed up in the parties and he disrupted everything to, um, in in a more glamorous perspective, a, a guy who really has shown up and is doing battle against the establishment now he's also compromising with him so i can go ahead point out things he did that looks like he's part of the team i totally get it but i think the reason that they they're trying to take him down from both sides now the republicans have kind of signed off on him they took him a long time they wanted him down too but but now they've kind of sent off realizing oh it's that or who right but i think trump if you look at old tapes of Trump talking about what he'd do if he was president, it's the same shit he's doing. So I, you know, he wants to clean up the swamp and everyone talks about what a bad person he is and this and that. And I get it. He's very idiosyncratic. But what if he actually is doing damage to that group? Well, and that's like the whole fucking QAnon thing, right? I mean, they all think that that, that he's kind of either actively in and understands what he's doing or inadvertently stumbled upon uh, this vein running through the country that is uh, like, like you're saying is kind of in control and is a criminal syndicate or whatever you want to call it. And that he inadvertently or actively, uh, I would probably even guess inadvertently has fucked yeah, up. I'm, has, I'm, has I would have said up, inadvertently, right. Has fucked up the works for them one way or the other. I would have said inadvertently. I, I'm, I'm leaning more towards that he is that, did you see the article that came out yesterday about Jeffrey Zucker? These fucking beers have been twist off the whole time. Can you believe that? And I ran all the way downstairs to get a bottle opener. Sorry. What were you saying? Jeffrey Zucker of, of uh, CNN has, has been, you know, militantly against Trump and somehow some, maybe it came out in the Woodward book or something. I don't know what the source was, but he apparently really, really understood how damaging Trump could be. Right. And that came out just, just yesterday or the day before or something. It's very fresh news. And he was talking about, he says, oh, Trump will destroy these guys in the debate. He never loses. So Zucker understood Trump's firepower. And so you, uh, you and think, if you look, you I read an article let, from 80. Do you think they'll let Biden debate? I don't. It's a, it's a catch-22. I don't. <laughs> So if Biden's as nuts as he looks, which could be a, a, a horrible media sales pitch, but I don't think so. I think he really does look like his marbles are rolling around the living room floor. Um, I, 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 I don't think he can hold up against Trump. For one thing, I'm pretty sure that all the dirt that Biden has, he has a ton of dirt in his closet. Oh, my God, his son, Hunter, alone. It's not just about Ukraine. It is all over the world. So I think that Trump has so much dirt against Biden and that Biden, it'll be like going against Muhammad Ali and you're, you're roped, roped in the corner. And, uh, and people like to pretend like Trump's nuts. He's not nuts. He's idiosyncratic. So I think he'll chew Biden to shreds. Um, I'm looking at Harris, and I think she could get destroyed too. 
And I think the reason she could get destroyed is because it, it's not a well-formulated thought, but from what I've read about her, her habits as a prosecutor, stuff like that, that she is the supreme grifter. She really has just been an opportunist and, and done yeah, and, 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 and it, it emanates from her. It's dripping off of her. You really yeah, yeah, can't. Yeah, it's almost like he, he can't even hide it. Yeah, so I'm it's not like sure she's her, a... She's her, just, her affect, her whole affect, very, very similar to Hillary in the sense that it's yeah. I hate to draw that analogy very, because that yeah, puts but it's her right very at the formulaic and very. I mean, right down again to the Breakfast Club interview, right where Hillary said, "I got the hot sauce in my purse," and Kamala Harris said, "Oh, I was getting high listening to Snoop Dogg." You know, while she's a couple of years prior had thrown. By the way, prison reform is one of the biggest issues that I think is also adding to the socioeconomic stress in the country. A lot of it having right. to do with throwing all of these nonviolent offenders in prison. And right. she was at the she was at the, the helm of the USS. She was racking up stats like crazy right. chucking drug offenders in jail. Mm-hmm. And hiding evidence and crap like that, supposedly. And I, this... So she just comes off as just a total phony. Right. But so so then the question is, in the next two months, will that become a liability? I don't know. I thought he was going to take Warren uh, and then she just couldn't get legs. And and uh, here's the thing that astonishes me. This really astonishes me. I, my brother and I were both right wingers. I know this shocks your listeners. Uh, we talked about whether we could vote for Bernie four years ago. Yeah, we talked about this thinking, you know, he's going to get neutered and he's not. He's not crazy, you know, Trump looks a little crazy. And so we pondered Bernie. And, and for two Nick Reagan Republicans to ponder whether Bernie's the best choice is outlandish. Well, because at this point, Dave, you just want somebody that is at least true to what it is that they believe in, right? I, the, and the, that's the thing with, right. The thing with Sanders and Trump is they both say what they want to say and they both mean what they say and they both kind of are adhering to, you know, they have this mentality, which is just they're going to shoot from the hip and fuck it. If you don't like it, that's how it is. And I always right. respected that about Sanders, always. You know, he right. came off as an honest guy. I didn't agree with him from an ideological he was, perspective he was at all. swimming against the current exactly. his whole professional career. Exactly. And in a political field where you have people like Kamala Harris and you have people like Hillary Clinton and to some degree some of these other candidates. And there's people on the right, too, that are the same way. Like, I can't stand Ted, Oh, the right bench was so shallow but four years ago. Oh, my God. And so everybody's just full of shit. So, 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 um, so here's what I would have predicted is four years ago, the, uh, the DNC engineered everything way too much. They picked a candidate, really, in my opinion, against the will of the people. And then she turned out to be a flawed candidate. And what they needed to do this time was to find another Obama. They needed to find some guy, and there's more guys like Obama out there. They need to find a person who is articulate, likable, uh, good at the microphone, not, not a lot of baggage. And what did they find? They found a guy who's got 40 years, 40 plus years of political baggage, and really for a progressive party, the wrong kind of baggage. And he's demented, and he's got a bad rep for groping little kids. <laughs> And then they sign him up in a ticket with a grifter. And I'm thinking, have you guys learned nothing? Yeah. It, maybe they don't think they can win. Maybe maybe these are throwaway candidates. I mean, I feel like it it it's so like if you told me, if you put me in a room and said come up with a democratic ticket based on the people that were on the stage that you think could win, I mean, I would have went with Elizabeth Warren. I would have went with somebody who's, you know, who who can speak and who is. She wasn't marketing well. I thought she was going to do really well. If Elizabeth Warren had maintained what the the person I knew many years ago was a sort of matronly, uh, thoughtful person who very left wing, but 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 a supporter of the little guy. Right. Right. The consumer, the person getting hammered by the system, her hatred of banks was a highly marketable thing. And she was doing well whenever the bank when when uh, when Bloomberg showed up, Warren's polls numbers rose. Yeah. So. So. But 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 she also she somehow personally signed up for the shrill screamer type. 
Yeah, I don't know. Her and Bloomberg would have been a great would have been that. a great ticket. Bloomberg just fucking Buttigieg's couldn't get out of his own way. Man. Personality. Elizabeth Warren needed Buttigieg's personality. Yeah. Something like that, right? Yeah. And she had it at one point, in my opinion. Buttigieg would have been a much better candidate than Joe Biden. Except for he's so green. He might come up later. But the, here's the deal. I think the Republic, here's the Republican bench for 2024. So I think the, if, if I had to be betting money... I think the odds on favorites got to be Pence. Now, things could happen bad. But Pence, who, you know, I'm an atheist, so Pence's biblical background doesn't sell well with me, but I've gotten more flexible with old age. I've realized that religion plays a role in society, just not my life. Um, but Pence has been in administration with bullets flying in every direction, and somehow he has not even been winged. Right, that's true. He, he got winged a little not wearing a mask, right? If that's the wing, holy cow, right? That's a nothing. So Pence has got the odds on favorite. Then you got guys, you got guys like Jim Jordan and Dan Crenshaw. And I'll tell you, if they could flip Tulsi Gabbard over or something, you know, yeah. God damn it. They're, they're, so I think that the Republican bench looks better to me than the Democratic bench, which has gotten so left wing. Right. Left of center. No problem. The boomer generation is left of center on some issues and right and center on yeah, others. They've gone right? full communist, full Marxist, full, full Marxist, full communist, full everything. And people who don't even believe it. Have, and so you look you look at the DN, you looked at the DNC convention and it was a catastrophe. It really was not good. And you look at the RNC convention. and It was brilliant. Now, Trump haters will just gag on their vomit when I say that. But it was, they, they, it was uplifting. They're saying, look, we are a great country. The DNC said, look, we're an awful, we're an awful, awful, awful right. shape. Right. And you know what people want to hear right now? They want to hear we're a great country. Right. And then that, then, then the, the RNC, to their credit, brought minority after minority after minority, Herschel Walker and all sorts of people after that. And I, here's my, my supposition. So the DNC went for some really fringy type speakers that I don't think the center gives a damn about. So the RNC goes after heavy, heavy dose of minority speakers, which is consistent with them trying to get the minority vote to move over, right? right. That's clear. They're trying, they're trying to win the minority vote over while the DNC is trying to get Wall Street and Silicon Valley, which they've already got. So the two parties have switched roles in some crazy ass way. But, but so, so, so if you take a dozen white supremacists, real live, died in the flesh, white supremacists. And you put in front of them a dozen black guys wearing MAGA hats. They're going to give each other hugs. <laughs> I don't know if the black guys would, but the, the, the supremacists will not be offended by a black guy wearing a MAGA hat. I don't think I'm speaking for white supremacists. I'm not qualified. Some would say I am, but I'm not. <laughs> but I don't think... I don't think any part of the Republican Party is offended by the the minority side of the party. No, I don't. Whereas think the so Democrats went for some pretty wacky, fringy types, I don't and think I think so people are going, you know, I don't really care about that. I think I think the I think a lot of Democrats would like to say, hey, we need police. We want the cities to stop yeah. burning. Yeah, and 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 minorities, and you know. People not of color come too. together on those things on the on the very same issues. You know, Kim you know Kim Klasik, they... Kim Klasik, who's running in Baltimore, put out a great ad where you know she interviews a couple of minorities in Baltimore, and and they're like, defund the police. You know, hell no, we need the police on our streets. We need more police. You know, and so right. so eighty four percent or something said they want more police. Yeah, there's this like kumbaya Campus moment reform. over. There's this like kumbaya moment over everybody just wants law and order. Everybody wants a space to raise their family. Everybody wants to love one right. another. You know, like that's it. So, so I, it might have been campus reform. Who knows? But someone sent a reporter out in the street and asked a bunch of white guys about whether it was fair that 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 you couldn't vote without an ID. Yeah. Right? Remember the that. debate about IDs. They went around and they had all these hipsters said, no, that's racist, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's not fair. You don't have access to this and that. And then they went into the black community 
And they go, sure, it's fair. They go, what do they think? We're stupid? We yeah. don't know how to get an ID? What yeah, everybody was like, about? I got my ID on me right now. And they were like, do you yeah, know where the Thomas DMV said, is? You know, down the street, like, you can go get a photo yeah. ID down here. Anyone can get it. She said, I don't know anybody that doesn't walk it's, around it's, with ID. It's, it's, so it's a classic case. So one of the interesting earliest cases of someone talking about this crap was Malcolm X. Malcolm X said, beware of the liberals. They, they say they're coming to help, but they want the power. And he said, so take their advice, don't give them the power. And that is some pretty deep thinking on part of Malcolm. I would have loved to have seen what Malcolm X could have done if he stayed alive. Well, I'm Because he, he had, and he was a case of redemption. He came from a, what looked like would be a life of crime, and he'd end up most of his life in jail. And he woke up, and I just would I'd love to see what he could have done politically and socially if he'd been able to stay alive. I, I, for example, bringing Islam into the black community, I think, was just brilliant. It was brilliant. Because, because it brought order and reason and, 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 and for, for, for some people who needed it. Right? Like in uh, the best analogy, I said, you know, we all, all heard about how bad the church was in the Middle Ages. And you read about, oh, you know, they did this, they tortured these guys. Then you read about it in earnest, and what you find out is in a world that was chaotic, in a world that only by fire, the church brought organization. Right. And the church kept the nobles in check. The church would say, hell's so bad, if you don't behave yourselves, you are going to go to hell. And the nobles say, okay, I will stop beating on the peasants. And you discover that the church, even in that period of time where its rep couldn't be worse, played a role and so i well these are tony these are phenomenal tony robbins always said you know tony robbins a self-help coach yeah he, oh, I know he always robbins. says you know find something to serve bigger than yourself or find something to worship bigger than exactly yourself. I what it is and and that's quintessential example right because that that brings order and that there's you know listen i wasn't a very religious person for a very long time i'm still i wouldn't consider myself overtly religious at all but there is an argument for structure and in addition to that there's a scientific argument for prayer and for uh spirituality in general and and what that does for people physiologically um you know regardless of whether or not somebody's in the yeah, it's sky like a placebo effect yeah exactly exactly and so, so uh, I, I think you made a great point a year two years ago i wrote about i said i said i'm a pro-choice atheist and I'm now going to speak in support of religion. And I wrote about five or six pages in support of religion. And and what I think, what I think I began to notice was, it, it, it you know, when I was young, I said, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't buy the whole the, the whole stuff that, that that doesn't seem scientifically sound to me that they claim and things like that. Then you hear the horror stories of the Middle Ages. But what I real I, I really realized that um, first of all they brought the order that we've been talking about, and the second thing is um, the left decided they were going to try to move religion off to the perimeter, right? And it started many many years ago, and they started saying, "Look, you can't have religion in school," and I, I don't want someone hammering religion down my kid's throat. Although, if I live in maybe I don't I've got to pick a place up some some small town in Indiana, I could imagine wanting my kid getting religion in school. Right? I can imagine there's places where it's of hell, yeah, we bring Christ right into the classroom. I don't want to stop them from doing that. And so 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 they started pushing religion off the side and then they started saying, look, you can't do this, and then they started saying, Now you can't have Christmas, now you can't have this. And next thing you know, you're going you're trying to extinguish And they took they took under God out of the uh, Pledge of Allegiance at the DNC, didn't they? I don't know. Well, but but, they but did. that's the type of thing that would be done. And and I'm a pro choice guy, but now the left is trying to push abortion up to the point of contractions I go no that's genocide excuse me if you can't get to the end of the second trimester and make the call I don't want to hear about an end of third trimester abortion it's just too late that's not I I, 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 I the world doesn't need more kids but we don't need to be assassinating them on the way out of the womb right 
and and so 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 it gets to the extreme. The NRA doesn't need to support machine guns, right? I, if, if, the activists have control of the 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 the, the, uh, the microphones, and they're pushing their agendas so far off to the perimeter that the the rest of us who are trying to occupy the middle are sort of stunned by it. Yeah, the middle doesn't really exist anymore. Well, we are being pushed, and then there's then there's this terrible problem where we're watching these social. If you want to be a so- moderate, if you want to be a moderate right now, Dave, you're labeled as a racist, and you're labeled as uh, yeah. silence is violence. You got to pick a team, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, that that's exactly right. It, you know, I have a friend who's who's gay, who did not vote for Hillary. He did not vote for Trump, but he did not vote for Hillary, and he lost many friends. Well, that's wrong. If I lost friends because they didn't vote for whoever I voted for, I'd have none. That, that's just insane. Uh, there's an old quote that I post all the time. I think it's Thomas Jefferson. He just says, I never found politics or religion as reason from disconnecting from a friend. And, oh, I never heard that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's something yeah. like that. And and I post. But it is causing trouble. So, so you know it's caused some stress in my existence. Right. And and part of the problem is you have a get together and, and, and please explain to me what you can talk about that in no way, shape or form will bring COVID or the presidential elections into the discussion. There is no topic. Right. That you don't bring in COVID. And now you say, well, COVID is not political. Are you kidding me? Of course it is now. It didn't start out political, but the whole thing is political now. Yep. And so we can't even talk about a pandemic without going at each other's throats over whose fault it is. Well, let's let's wrap up with that. I mean, what do you uh, what are your thoughts on COVID and where we're at as a nation and what we've learned about the virus? Well, we talked about this on our last podcast, right? Yeah, but and, we, and you know, we're six no, no, months no, no, later no, it was, it in terms of data. It was a long time ago, and it was I was trying to figure out how lethal it was and stuff like that. And, and it's so where I'm at is it's clearly uh, more destructive than the flu. Um, it's got this the, the the nastiest part of this this pandemic, in my opinion, are the long haulers who get sick and they just don't seem to ever be able to get away from it. And there was a video the other day posted where this woman was teaching to her class and she was a long hauler and she seemed to be recovering and she's teaching to her class by zoom or whatever. And she just keeled over dead right in front of the class. They were trying to say, give us your address so that we can call an ambulance. And she just, before she could get it out, she's boom, dead. And uh, so the, I think we could find out that, kind of like 9-11 responders that 10 years from now, there's a lot of people with a lot of problems that we did not see coming. Mm-hmm. So I think it could be like that. That's that's the thing that lingers the most in my head. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I think the case count is soaring for a host of reasons, including how much testing you're doing. Also, we got so much testing going on while the death toll is plummeting. And to me, that's the best possible news because it means that we've learned how not to die or it means that we've clobbered most of the people who are susceptible right? or something. I don't know what it means, but if we can rip through the population and kill nobody. So for example, there's 11,000, I just read this the other day, 11,000 positive cases on college campuses. Now positive cases means the virus was detected. Right. Zero hospitalizations. Right. This is not the Black Death. This is killing people, no question, but it's not the Black Death. Now, where the debate gets super political is on drug treatment. And the one that I've tried to figure out is HCQ. And I have come to the conclusion the risk reward very much favors taking HCQ. So I am right now putting in motion the plans to get the fucking HCQ before I get sick. Because what I do know is if HCQ works, it's got to be taken early and it's got to be taken with zinc. I've got the zinc. I don't, I have access to HCQ. A friend of mine's wife was taking, can't take it anymore. And therefore he said, Oh, I'll give you it. I said, phenomenal. Um, 
And so, uh, so if I get it, I, I told my family, I said, if I get sick and I can't advocate for myself, I want HCQ. And you're going to have doctors who might have various opinions. Now, it turns out because it's so fucking political, my general practitioner in New York State cannot prescribe it. Yeah, it's a little crazy, isn't it? The fact and that he it's... believes and he believes in it. Isn't that a little crazy? The fact that it's been it's totally crazy around now, for now, forty years and there's been no. HCQ, they say the HCQ doesn't have you know blah blah double blind blah blah studies. I go yeah, and therefore you don't know that it doesn't work either. Now people will cite all sorts of studies that showed that it didn't do any good. They are all flawed, best I can tell. They all suffer from one of two problems. They were late stage, so they gave HCQ to people whose organs were rotted or they didn't give them zinc. And the HCQ supposedly works by opening up zinc channels and, and you gotta have zinc, you gotta have the zinc. And so, um, and so there's doctors all around the world saying, look, I'm treating patients by the hundreds. I swear this shit's working. Now that's anecdotal. As a scientist, I know it's anecdotal. You gotta have controls and this and that. But it's also been getting prescribed for 70 years. It's been used prophylactically. It, I want it. If they told me that eating goddamn fried eggs cured me, I'd be grilling up fried eggs, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and they say, well, there's risk. I go, no, there's not. It's been used for 70 years. I talked to a guy who was in Africa for three months. He took it for three months. Yes, there, of course there's risk. Some guy got into I got into it where he says, well, you know, I said, it, it's basically aspirin. He says, well, you don't think aspirin's dangerous? I go, are you going to try to tell me they should ban aspirin? Is that what you're about to tell me? And... Uh, so I'm a believer in HCQ until, until the right now. There's a couple of clinical trials doing it correctly. They ain't done yet. So we don't know. But I might get sick before we know. And I've said, I want HCQ. And if I can't advocate because I'm sitting there hawking up phlegm and suffering, please, all of you, and I said to the whole family, get me some fucking HCQ. Colum is on the record. He wants the HCQ. I'm going to join him on the record. And this is not because Trump said it. This is because the Chinese told us it was working back in January. And this is because people in Europe and Spain and India are using it, and they say it works. And you know why India uses it? They can't afford the expensive stuff. Right. And yeah, then, I the saw places one of their that early... have malaria, by the way, have tons of HCQ. It's like, oh, well, if HCQ works, they're giving it to people. And and, and my doc said, he says, I know there's one person that, that, that they were heading to the light, and they gave him HCQ, and boom, rallied right back. All and right. He says, I believe it. Colin wants so, HCQ. I will, uh, if I go down, just hit me with Jameson, maybe a little bit of bitters. But we're both on I record. I also don't want a ventilator. That's the other thing. No, all right, no ventilator for Colum. Anything well, the else? the ventilators were killing people. The What's ventilators that? were the source of the high fatality rate at the beginning. I was thing. reading that. Well, they were destroying the lungs, and then the, the, the virus had a field day in the, in the, the cell-damaged lungs. Yeah. And so, so the, the ventilators were being – maybe they know how to use them now. But I said, look, if the doc says, look, we either ventilate him or he dies today – and we he at least die while he's out cold. And I said, ventilate me. Don't let some doc talk you into thinking that somehow they're going to save me with a ventilator because I don't think they're going to. And uh, I, I don't trust I had a terrible here, – here's how fucked up our health system is. My wife has terrible health problems, 59 surgeries. That's just the beginning. One day she did a header. She broke her neck. I took her to the hospital. Why I drove her? Good question. I didn't think it was bad. But her hat and I, part way the hospital, I realized there was something worse. And so it turns out she had a double fracture in her neck, a 40% fatality rate. This is probably back in uh, probably seven years ago. She does another face plant during sheltering. And I didn't think much about it because she fell on a mulch path, right? This is a pretty soft landing. We're picking mulch out of her face. And she seemed fine, but at dinner, I noticed she was holding her head with her hand, which was the telltale symptom the first time. So I said, we're going to the hospital. She says, tomorrow. And I said, no, tonight. And my son was there, and his, his, his main squeeze was there. And uh, so I took her to the hospital. They wouldn't let me in. They take her in. Yeah. They give her a CT. They tell her it's negative. She never even saw a doctor. That's destroying a health system. 
Uh-huh. I've heard several similar stories too. So the next day, I I called my GP and I said, "You got to get me an orthopedic now." And he said, "You bet." So and it, there was no fracture. There was no fracture. But uh, but 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 so so the 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 the, uh, the instant the, the the diagnostics showing cancer, for example, would drop something like fifty percent. All those people that are, you know, predictable numbers year after year after year now down 50%. You know why? Because people didn't get tested. Right. And the, the no-show rate of chemo patients soared. People who were on chemo weren't showing up for their chemo. There's a lot of dead people out there. The suicide rate amongst teens is going to be ridiculous. Yeah, a lot of collateral damage, right? A lot of collateral damage, and they and and so there was some chick who got 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 recorded, uh, a person who's high up in the Los Angeles County, whatever Cook County, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, Los Angeles County, we'll call it, and charged making some of these calls. She said, "Well, uh, we're not going to open up the schools for the kids until after the elections." Now. If she really is keeping the kids out of school because of the elections, someone suffocate her because God damn it, you, not, not, do the experiment on the on the chokehold for Christ's sake. That, that's just that's so immoral. That's so unconscionable. By the way, if someone wants to open society knowing it's a bad idea for the elections, they too are bad people. Right. right. We should be trying to get this right. This is so important. But but there was a letter written by a single business a business owner, a restaurant owner that got posted yesterday and the guy talked about all the goddamn people that depend on him and how he's wrapping it up. He's done. And he says, we paid this many taxes to New York, this many taxes to the Fed. We've employed this many people over this many years. Those people are all gone now. He says, these people used to come and dispose of our grease, gone now. And he, and he connected the whole chain of connections because his restaurant went south because de Blasio said, you can't open your restaurant. Well, de Blasio because, doesn't know his ass from his elbow. Right, but he has the power to shut down New well, York Well, that's City. what's frightening. Right. And he's not making the decisions based on his best judgment. He's making his decisions political. Well, maybe that is his best judgment. Maybe maybe yeah, that's the best. Not. Maybe that's the fucking best he can do. Dave is just let the city go to ruins and just <laughs> okay. You know what I okay. mean? Maybe that's maybe that's, that's the best he can do. Model. Maybe maybe he's got you know the fucking IQ of a can of Pringles. Okay, and that's the best he can do. And we're looking at. Bill de Blasio's best. He thinks that guy right now thinks he's doing his job effectively. I mean, that, that, yeah. that's, you know, that's, so that's the question horrifying. is, could he, pa- could he pass a lie detector test on that? That's the question. Could he pass the civil service exam would probably be a better test. Well, that's he, a separate question. Could he question. pass yeah. fifth grade, uh, you know, civics would be a better question. So the, so the, what here to, to finish the, the, the virus, I don't think we're going to get another wave. I also um, am not going to get in line to get a vaccine because the fastest we've ever developed a vaccine in the past, our record was six years. And any vaccine jammed out the door like this, you guys can all get in line. I'm going to watch and see how you do. I am not going to be patient. I would be patient zero if it was the experiment. I would be willing to say, give it. I, I'd, I'd think twice because my wife, I got to take care of her and stuff like that. But I'd be patient zero and say, go ahead, give me the test virus. Because then you're doing something. Right. I am not going to be patient zero of the commercial virus. And I, I and maybe Cornell's going to say, look, you either get the vaccine or you don't work here. And then I got a problem. I'll, I'll try to stall. But I'm going to watch and see if there's – because the vi- people think vaccines, once you figure them out, they just work. They don't. They destroy nervous systems when they go bad. There's horrible examples of vaccines out there that didn't work. So if we get one of those, right? Think of the thalidomide scare when they gave drugs to pregnant women to calm them down and it destroyed a whole generation of babies in Germany, right? That, that don't don't just put faith in it. And I'm a vaxxer. I just won't trust this vaccine because it was too fast. And, you know, a company like Moderna looks like a scam to me. Moderna came up with this encouraging result. So Trump gave him five hundred million. He they gave him a they gave him a they gave him a the win that he wanted. 
They gave him the promising lead that he wanted. Meanwhile, the insiders were selling shares as fast as they could. Several of them liquidated every share. Yeah, I saw that. Now tell me they tell me they believe their vaccine's working. Now they're talking about a vaccine that works maybe fifty percent. Excuse me, that's not a vaccine. I'll take HCQ over that any day. Fifty percent vaccine? Would you would you be happy with a fifty percent polio vaccine? Well, I think to some degree, I mean, depending on what the side effects are, um, which I can't comment on, but I think to some degree, there's been a lot of vaccines that have only been 50% effective, but have actually been successful in pushing us further toward herd immunity, even by just being effective on 50% of people that get them, right? Except for the fact, yeah, exactly. I think that what we're witnessing here, though, is the push for the vaccine is a mega buck is the quest for bucks. I think it's a monstrous, monstrous grab. I, I you know, and, and the other thing is, you know why they're gonna rush it? If I'm right, and this thing's fizzling, and, and it really does look like it's fizzling to me from the stats. Now, the people are gonna keep dying, but, but, but the humps are done, I think. I could be wrong, but they look like they're done. They're gonna rush the vaccine, because if it fizzles too much, who needs a vaccine? Right. So if all of a sudden the body count's real low, which by the way, they're going to say, well, the reason it's low is because we did such a good job managing this pandemic. No, the thing fizzled. The damn thing just fizzled. Yeah. And, and, we're... and, and that's what they do. And by the way, rat studies at the turn of the century show that if you serially infect a rat and not through some selection mechanism, you just inject it in rat A, it gets sick, inject it in rat B, it gets sick, inject it, viruses attenuate not just from mutate, they, there's something that just attenuates them and they become less and less lethal. And maybe not every virus, but this is all making sense. So now the virus appears to be spreading a lot, but killing very few. Right. Well, I think a big part of that too is the expansion of the testing as well. I mean, I right. think if you're like me, I mean, my argument has been that this thing has run farther than we thought that it had uh, already. And so consistent with that would be the increase in testing would be an increase you would see the increase in the infection count but not necessarily in the fatalities so well the other interesting data point a year or two from now will be what was the what was the total fatality rate in the united states so if you look at the cdc's website you can see that there's a spike in total fatalities within the united states they say well that's got to be the covid right and I think the total fatality counts a hard number to fake because there's death certificates and shit like that. But, um, but the interesting question is what if a calendar year from now, the fatality rate dips and that is what we did is we pulled some deaths forward by six months. That's it. Yeah. So we scrubbed out the nursing homes. You can say, Oh yeah, but grandma got an extra six months. I, you know, I don't care grandma's grandchildren got humped they've been mutilated by by social distancing their brains are fried my colleagues who have kids in school say that they're kind of putty heads at this point they we've destroyed the global economy at some level and i think the consequences haven't even shown up yet i think you're right about that economic and so we did all that to 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 to, to keep someone to allow someone who 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 would have died at 95 yeah, um, I, I, we somehow allowed that to, to allow them to live to 95 and said they died at 94. I don't, I don't, I don't think that was a fair trade. Now I don't blame people for not knowing. See, that's the thing. But I think in the end, we're going to have some answers as to whether we made the right or wrong calls. And I think on the virus and also on the social unrest, like we talked about earlier, I think it's going to take decades, but looking back, I think we're going to be surprised at what we find, what the catalysts were, and uh, precisely what was happening. We'll have a clearer understanding of what was happening and how our reaction to both of these things uh, stacked up in terms of efficiency in addressing the actual problem versus uh, potentially any number of red herrings that might be out there. Right.
So, and and it's going to be figured out by people who didn't make bad decisions along the way. It's going to be figured out by people who don't have a horse in the race. Right. You know, problems are never solved by the people who create them. Right. Right. That's and true. so, uh, so yeah, we are going to get answers. It's going to be a long ways from now. My big fear is every time we get a sniffle, we're going to shut down the economy. I don't think so because I think people said enough is enough is enough. Don't do this to me again. I don't think I think they'll rebel. I think that's what happened. Remember when everything was sheltering and then all of a sudden within like three days, we sort of moved to unshelter. Yeah. Very quick. I, it could have been that blonde, you know, hairstylist who said, screw it and stood up in front of a judge and said, you know, I opened up because my employees need to feed their kids. Yeah. That could have been the shot at Lexington, Lexington and Concord. But, uh, but, uh, so I don't know. My inclination is to believe a, it was pretty lethal. B, it was not horrifically lethal. And I think there's people who really did pay a very high price who shouldn't have. But, but I, you know, I had two colleagues this year die of a heart attack in their 50s. Now, if they had gotten COVID, they probably would have died of heart attacks. So was that a comorbidity? Because they didn't know they were going to die of a heart attack. Right. It's sad. According to the CDC, there's only 10,000 pure COVID non-comorbidity cases, 10,000 total in the country. Wow. And a lot of these details are just going to be, they'll never be hashed out because there's just right. so but much One could make area. the argument is maybe it's 10,000 people who didn't know they had a comorbidity. Right. Correct. Because every year there's people who die in their 40s and 50s of heart attacks that were not diagnosed, including my, my, my wife's father did that. It's on like 44. He keeled over. Boom. No warning. He would have been, you know, one of the, one of the scrubs. He would, have, he would have been taken out by the virus potentially. I, I just don't know how to think about this. But I, I saw a number. That, what was the number I saw where they estimate the number of people who died? What was it from? Um. I think someone put an estimate on teen suicide rate already is spiking up above the norm in the country by something like 5,000 between age, maybe 24 to 34 or something like that. That's not teen. I, I don't remember the details, but they're already trying to estimate the number of things like suicides that were, that were not statistical. And that's another thing too, that we're, <clears throat> excuse me. That's another thing too, that we'll get a much clearer picture on, you know, decades down the road what the collateral damage was right and how many how many people beat their wives for three months straight because they sat around drinking paps blue ribbon and without a job yeah let, well let's not denigrate paps blue ribbon but yes hey, I, you know, we, we can denigrate don't... wife beaters but be careful around paps blue ribbon all right <laughs> anybody that's ever gone to bob and barbers in philadelphia understands the sanctity <laughs> of paps blue ribbon all right column listen my friend it's been wonderful chatting i appreciate you coming back on my buddy uh, hopefully yeah, well, in a couple we, we of months there. we can we do it again. We got down and got dirty, so. We sure did, yeah. And we still have quite a bit more to cover. I'm thinking maybe after we watch these uh, first couple debates heading into the election, <laughs> we can get you back on in a month or two and uh, and, and really mop up what we, uh, what we didn't finish today. But I just want to say thanks so much for taking the time to come on and talk. And yeah. I know my listeners were so stoked to hear from you again. So I'm glad you're well, back out there, down. Man. We warm down. I'm, I, I'd like to thank the three of you who are left and and uh, and all those who left after I told you to search Tony Podesta's art collection. Um, <laughs> uh, oh. People have no clue what they're signing up for when they listen to this podcast. No clue. No question about it. So, All right, Colin. We'll talk soon, brother. Adios. Thanks bye. so much. Bye-bye. That was the one, the only, Dave Colum, Betty R. Miller, professor of chemistry at Cornell and a bunch of other stuff that I don't have in front of me, but just general interesting character to talk to. And I consider him a buddy of mine. Happy to have Dave back on. I hope we can do it again at some point soon. But for right now, folks, it is Saturday. It's the afternoon. I have a cornhole slash wiffle ball slash can jam tournament to attend. Hence the lubricating with several beers during the podcast. So I'm going to go take care of that. Lay the fucking smack down on some clowns and cornhole. While you uh, go off and enjoy your life as well and enjoy your weekend. All right, fools. I'll talk to you this upcoming week. I got Whitney Webb coming on. Peace.